I'm not going to prison to be good and I'm not going to prison to get along with officers. I'm not going to prison to make friends. I'm going there to do my time, I'm going there to get big. So I'm, I sell drugs in prison, I fight officers in prison, I fight other inmates, I rob inmates, whatever it is, I do. So I nearly got attacked. I could have died in prison for the smallest amount of, of, of drugs and a dead phone. So they've gone to Selfridges dressed as Muslims with burkas on, but sledgehammers underneath the burkas. Like pulled out sledgehammers, just started smashing up cabinets. I was all about the money. Oh, I did not want to be a drug dealer, but I knew drug dealers got money. So, okay, cool. Drug dealers get money. They get girls too. I like girls. I'm doing that. That's what I'm doing, you know? Identity parade. I'm of course, this gets me free. Now I can go home after this, smoke some weed and relax. You know what I'm saying? Because being in jail for something you didn't do is... That six months was the hardest time in my life because you don't know if you're going to get 20 years. People play this big gangster role, but they haven't got the brains, the intelligence. They haven't got the, what it takes, you know? And I was one of those people that never had what it takes, but would always put myself in the position to try and do it. This life of crime, it cost me so much stuff that I didn't put into the equation. So much stuff that I didn't value. My mate's son was arrested for murder. Blew someone's face off at 15. 15 years old. Pulled like a big Rambo knife. Honestly, it was the size of his arm. I just see it and he just went whack. Hit me straight there. And everything just stopped. My whole time just stopped. It was crazy. Because I'm Daniel Lazar. I'm in Camden. This is my area. This is what I do. I am absolutely hooked on Living in London channel. The link will be at the top of the description box because Daniel Lazar is a master storyteller. And so many people have got prison experiences. There's a wealth of talent and knowledge and stories in prison. But some people get out and they're not very capable of telling their stories. If you go over to Daniel's channel, Living in London, your stories go for 10, 20 minutes. I'll, I'll just run down some of the titles to get you enticed. Teeth got smashed out, jaw broke by lifer, first kilo of coke, robbing grow yard, cousin kidnapped, two murders, one suicide. They tried to murder me. And it's not just his storytelling ability though, it's also his energy. I mean, he's so lively when he gets on camera, he was lively in the car just now. This is his natural personality. And um, I hope you guys are as riveted as I am. And you go down and support what he's doing and subscribe. How long have you had the channel? Um, since January I started it. I've had the, in my mind to start YouTube for years. I'd watch uh, podcasts like you and uh, certain others. And I'd just, I'd just get, you know, a certain um, idea in my head. But I never had the confidence, you know. I had to beat my own demons first. But yeah, like I said, January this year. All right, so I'd like to start out with a really gripping story, like a really crazy story. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the craziest one that'll engage the viewers the most? Okay, which camera do I look in, just so I know? All right, so that one's you, that, that one's, one's both of us, and that one's me. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so the craziest story that person that happened to me was when I was younger. And this is one of the craziest stories, because you've got to remember certain people have d certain... Um, ideas of what crazy is. But for me, this was out of the blue. I did not expect this. So it's 2001. And in Camden, it's not community, but everyone knows everyone in Camden. And everyone's tight. We know each other's family. So if anything happens, we kind of know stuff. But what happened was Somalians were coming over at the time. Like a lot of them were coming over. And we didn't really know them, but they were coming over to, like in, in London in general. So what happened there was I was selling drugs at the time. I had runners and that. but I'm 18 myself, so my runners are young as well, like 15, 16 at the time, some are 14. And then one of them got robbed by this guy and we didn't know who he was, just a black guy. And then a couple others got robbed and now I'm like, oh my God. So the Somalians were robbing the workers, okay? So I caught a couple of them. I messed them up. Them up. Like I, I really, really went in on him. I smashed him up, like I battered him, but I let the guy know who I was because I'm Daniel Lazar. I'm in Camden. This is my area. This is what I do. 
Yeah, so the guy had heard the name, but I'd done the job on him, you know? And then, um, so one day I'm walking down the street, I'm with my girlfriend, I'm walking my girlfriend's friend home, being a gentleman, trying to do the right thing, impress my girlfriend. Anyway, so I walk her home all the way up to Bell Size, and then we're walking back, me and my girlfriend. My girlfriend was a pretty girl, mixed race, blue eyes. So we're walking back, it's on Ferdinand Street, just by my mum's, and um, walking, and there's three guys coming towards me, black Somalian guys. And I didn't know anything. Remember, I'm feeling myself back then. I've got a massive ego. My head's big as it is. But trust me, it was filled with ego back then. And I thought I was just the man, you know? So three guys come towards me. They're looking at my pretty girlfriend. I'm like, hmm, yeah, I'm not feeling this energy. I'm like, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? You know, that kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Now me, I have a thing of telling people my name. Not no more. <laughs> but back then, it was almost like to scare people off. You know who I am? Daniel Lazar. <laughs> yeah, that you usually get a reaction. But like I told you, these guys had come from Somalia. They were basically fresh almost, you know, and they'd all moved in and they'd had their own community. But they didn't give a fuck about me. Do you know what I'm saying, Sean? So like... And you were, you're six foot four and you were hench. And I was big then as well. Do you know what I'm saying? Always in and out of jail and always had the reputation of fighting because I was bullied so much as a kid. And all that pent up frustration, it just, it, it just released from me. So anyway, I'm going mad at these guys. And then now there's an argument. Now, I didn't have a knife on me then. I hadn't stabbed anyone by then. I, I hadn't been stabbed by then. It was just fighting. We were just fighting, you know? Almost like just finishing school and you start to fight and stuff. And um, so I'm like, my name's Daniel Lazar, blah, blah, blah. Now, I've just beaten up a couple of Somalians a couple of weeks, maybe a week before, yeah? And they're all in a group, so they've known the name now. Now they're all looking at each other, yeah? And like the energy's got a bit more serious now. And then they're just talking all of a sudden, Pull like a big Rambo knife. Honestly, it was the size of his arm. I just see it and he just went whack, hit me straight there. And everything just stopped. My whole time just stopped. It was crazy. Fractured my um skull, severed two arteries. And I'm standing there now. And uh, my head's wobbling. I was with my friend. My friend actually run off to pretend like he had a no I don't even know what he did, but he ran off anyway, yeah? <laughs> so now I'm left there. My, head, my head's cracked open. And the smiling guys have run off and I'm just standing there. The girl's screaming. And... um. Claret was pouring out of my head and everything. And um, yeah, almost died. Um, luckily, I was right by my house. People called an ambulance. And within half an hour of the incident, I was in the hospital. And um, just getting seen to in that. But yeah, that was a very, very traumatic time in my life, you know? <sighs> and you're a friend of Chris Slough. Uh, Charlie Slough. Charlie Slough. Charlie Slough. Charlie Slough. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Me and Charlie go back years. Like, his head of security. Shout out to Harry. I won't be up your real name, but I see you boys out there doing your thing. Hopefully you can see me and in the future we can get something going. But yeah, me and Charlie Sloth go back years, man. I've got so many stories with Charlie, man. And does he really speak like that? Because I've seen him, the DJ. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's You're doing an impersonation energy. while he's, he's speaking. He's like, he's like um, that was sick, man. Oh my God, guys. Oh my God. This tune's sick. This guy's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's Charlie Sloth. A lot of people don't get that energy. It's almost like a Camden energy. A lot of us Camden boys were good guys, but you know, like when you're in a negative space, you can't necessarily be a good guy and thrive. So you've got to kind of, you know, you've got to kind of like not be yourself in that world, which is messed up. So what was your story about your teeth getting smashed off? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My God. So <clears throat> I'm in prisons. Like what was I arrested for? Me and my co D was arrested for armed robberies. Was on a flying, was on an obo observation from a flying squad. They had us because they knew what we was up to. And um, yeah, so we'd been arrested for conspiracy to supply, no, conspiracy to rob that was, and um, a cash van. And so we were in prison at the time. And I'm the same. I'm not going to prison to be good. And I'm not going to prison to get along with officers. I'm not going to prison to make friends. I'm going there to do my time. I'm going there to get big. I'm going there to just and get out again, you know, and just do the same thing over and over again. That's what's on my mind. So I'm, I sell drugs in prison. I fight officers in prison. I fight other inmates. I rob inmates. Whatever it is, I do because I'm not changing just because I've gone to prison, you know. But you're a changed man now from that. Of course yeah, I am. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but, but this just is... Just to make it clear yeah, for the yeah, viewers. This is, <laughs> this is the mindset of how I was back then. Yeah, yeah. So when I'm in these systems, I'm around, okay, the... There's certain ways you can do your prison sentence, the nice way or the hard way. For me, I always used to do it the hard way. I never knew, but it was just how I was. So anyway, I used to sell drugs in prison, um, heroin, weed, all that type of stuff. And um, you'd get canteen on the weekend. So waiting for the canteen to come, I was in High Point at the time. They used to call it Knife Point because um, 
it was a very very yeah 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 it was a rough prison man a lot of people got stabbed up and that in there and um so I'm waiting for my canteen but I can hear like walking on the landing and I'm like doesn't sound like the canteen walk to me you know you like when you when you're in prison you hear the kids you have like a you familiar, know all the noises yeah you have all, all the noises and I'm like yeah this doesn't sound good so anyway I'm hearing more and more footsteps they come outside my cell and they're like look Mr Lazar uh, you need to come down with us. And I'm like, for what? Anyway, they wanted to kick me out of the prison for drug culture because when you're selling drugs, they need to keep other prisoners safe and you could be using violence to just get your debts paid or whatever. So, or um, or get your debts paid to you. So because of that, they kicked me out of the prison. There was a group of us. We all got kicked out of the prison and um, I still had drugs on me at the time. But, and I'm still going to be the same person. I know people in most prisons in England, yeah? Um, most of my friends are still in prison. Yeah, that's the sad thing. And um, <clears throat> so they've shipped, they've kept me in a block for six weeks. I was in there for six weeks on GOAD. They call it good order and discipline where they just, you don't have a release date from the block. You're just down there until they can either kick you out of prison or they feel that you're good enough to return to normal population. But there's six of us, maybe seven. Anyway, they separated us all and they shipped us out to all different prisons. Now, I got told I was going to Maidstone. They're like, Maidstone's the best, Chow. You can cook there. It's good. You've got all types of stuff going on. I was happy to be there. You know, I'm like, fuck my friend. I'm going to Maidstone. It's good. So I get to Maidstone. It's a shithole. It's the worst job I've ever been to. Everyone uh, just don't believe prisoners, people, because they don't mostly even know themselves. You know, they're mostly hearing it third hand. I get there. It's like an old Victorian. It's gloomy. It's dingy. Even the prisoners look more violent in there. I'm like, okay, this is definitely something new. <laughs> So I get into Maidstone now and I'm still trying to do the same thing. I'm trying to get a phone. I'm trying to sell drugs. I'm trying to just do me whatever it takes to just make this sentence and make me just whatever, you know? Crazy, crazy point of view. <clears throat> so I'm going around to all the people. Remember, nobody knows me in this prison. I've come to a prison and if you don't know me from anywhere, you see a tall guy with glasses, bald head, you may think like, I don't really know this guy. This guy doesn't look like anything much, but like I've got a bad temper on me. I'm I'm a bit of you know. I was just it was a bit weird. So, but anyway, so I'd got I'd, I'd find out who had the drugs. I'd find out everything, and um, so uh, I had my drugs uh, from the last prison, but I bought a bit extra because I needed canteen. And in prison, you can get canteen once a week, and once a week is like. You know, to buy all your shower gels, your phone credits. Sometimes you don't have enough money. You know what it's like, innit? It's just, it's just hard to get all your stuff in. So I used to sell drugs to get other bits of canteen. And um, that was my plan in a new prison in Maidstone. So um, I'll buy a heroin because I can hustle that, yeah? But I'll go to buy the heroin off the person and um, he sells me it. Now, remember, I'm new to the prison. I don't know anyone. So he's, I'm an easy target to get robbed. I'm not, I'm not associated with anyone. I don't know anybody. So uh, I'm trying to get to a better wing now. So I'm like, where's the wing for the gym? And like, I'm a gym person. When I go to jail, as long as I can get gym and, and weed I'm, and a mobile phone, I'm fine. And um, um, I go to the wing where there's gym. <laughs> I get there, like everyone's got muscles. Obviously, it's big. Like everyone's got muscles. No one likes me. I just stick out like a sore thumb. Okay, cool, whatever. I'll get into it. I know what prison's like sometimes. It just, it makes, you know, it makes it difficult. Now, in Maidstone, you're on the ground floor, which is um, the ones landing. And um, you have to be on there. There's no TVs on the ones landing. Um, and you have to pass a drug test to get up on the threes and the fours. Now, I had no weed at the time. I'd been in the block for ages, so I didn't have anything like that. So I'd pass the drug test. And I was selling we um um like heroin to like the other prisoners, and um one prisoner had a phone, so I got the phone off him, give him like I don't know a bit of heroin, and now I'm selling heroin for phone credits and canteen. But now I'm the new guy, and like this new guy has got a phone, he's got drugs, he's got loads of canteen coming. Yep, he's tall, looks like a nerd. We're gonna get him. Uh -oh. <laughs> We're gonna get him. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they they send me to go up to the fours. I'm in the, like, honestly, man, it was like the top corner in the bloody top landing in the corner cell. There was hardly any light in. It was just, it just felt like a bloody bad situation. So I go up there with my bag. You know, you get your plastic bag with all your belongings. I go up there, put my stuff down. <sighs> Within ten minutes, the door clicked over, and like you can close prison cell doors or you can just click them over. So like they just um. Don't shut, but they were like, you can't open it from the, from the inside. Unless like you grab like something can try and pull it. And so I heard the door click and I turn around and there's three big black guys. 
No, I'm lying. There's two big black guys in my cell, yeah? Muslim guys, yeah? But mu converted in jail to Muslim. Like, it's like a gang in there. Anyway, so, um, like, give us the phone, give us the heroin. B, they called it. And I'm trying to play it off innocent. Like, like, what do you mean? No, 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 no. I haven't got anything. I'm a good talker. I can talk my way out of this situation. You know, I can hustle my way out of this situation. One of the guys, remember, these guys are big, big. Everyone's big in this jail, yeah? Because um, I'm on the gym wing. He's got his hand in his tracksuit bottom pocket. I'm like, nah, 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 I think I can talk my way out of it. These guys did not want to hear anything your boy had to say. <laughs> he just had hot pepper sauce in Kona bottle. He just swung it. Vroom! Oh. Full pelt. And like, I've been hit with like a, like I say, machete, other tools, stabbed and all that kind of stuff. And it's almost like a taste and a flash of light when something real bad happens to you, but you can't register it. Well, that's what I get anyway. It's like a flash of light and a taste, a metallic taste in my mouth. I got that. I knew something was terribly wrong. That was the start of it. They started beating me in the cell, but I'm big as well. So I'm wrestling with them now. Yeah. And obviously they're just getting in on me. Like they're just really getting in on your boy. So now I'm trying to open the door. I'm thinking, you know what? As long as they don't stab me, I can take all the punches and everything. They're trying to pull me back in. I'm trying to pull the door. And it's so hard because it's literally a gap within a millimeter that I've got to pull. So I'm pulling it, pulling it, pulling it. For some reason, there's resistance. There's bloody resistance. I'm pulling it, pulling it, finally open. There's about 10 crackers trying to keep the door closed. And I'm like, oh my God. My, <laughs> like I've got blood pissing out of my mouth. My teeth are not gone, but they're shattered. Like you'd shatter glass. And so my teeth are just shattered. There's nerve endings hanging out. Like, <sighs> like, like, like my head's all scarred up from the back where they were smashing <sighs> me. And this is over. Like on in jail, the heroin was mostly worth like 300 quid. The phone worth 200 quid. Out and out here in the real world, the phone was worth twenty pound. It was like a ten pound, maybe twenty pound bit of heroin. So I nearly got attacked. I could have died in prison for the smallest amount of of, of drugs and a dead phone. You know, <laughs> that was that was a hard time for me because you have got to remember, people, if you're a criminal and you live that life, then there's certain rules you've got to stand by. And when you're in prison now, like people know, like if you're gonna grass or this, that, the other. So you gotta take your licks. And I had a phone that time. That was my saving grace. So I managed to call my mum. I'm like, mum, I've been attacked. They're, they're, they're saying I gotta give names, um, or then or, or I can't, or, or I gotta stay in the prison. So I got my mum to call up the prison and um, just just go hard. You know, my mum, she's such a good woman. She always helps um, helps me out when I'm in a bad position. You know, and she got onto them and she moved me out of that prison. I got to cold and leave from there. But yeah, I hated Maidston, Bob. I hated Maidston. <laughs> and, and it was sold to yeah. you as like this yeah, luxurious. No, no, you're good. You're going to go there, cook your own food. And that was another thing. Like they, everyone had big knives and that. Where you can cook your own food. There's all knives. People got hot oil. I'm like, I'm in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely not again. Two murders, one suicide. Oh, that was a good one. So basically what happened was <sighs> your boy now was, um, I'm in the life. And you've got to remember, when I talk about this, I'm giving you my point of view of how I was thinking at the time. I'm a totally changed person now, but it's just I'm, I'm trying to engage with how I was back then, you know? So don't think, oh my God, he's still in it. No, no. I'm spiritual and all that good stuff. But we're going to get into it now. So it's, I'm 18 years old. None of my friends have been murdered. I've, I've exper I experienced one death because my friends was getting chased by police. And then uh, they crashed into a wall and one of them went through a window and landed into the wall and died. Yeah, that was the first death we ever had around in our group. But no one had ever been murdered by someone. Okay, cool. So um, one day, I just get a phone call um, off my friend. They're like, yo, what's going on? I'm like, what's happening? And like, we're they're talking as if like, what's going on? Like, Did you hear about Fat Frankie? That was one of our friends. And I'm like, yo, uh, what's going on with Frank? And they're like, he's dead. And like, there was no like serious thing. I'm like, oh, whatever. You know, like, no, 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 seriously, he's dead. So I'm like, what? So I've gone up there now and, I, and, and I've gone to find out what's happened. Because um, he's my mate and he only lived up the road from me, like Kentish Town, it's not far. So I've gone there, I've seen a whole load of police, a whole load of everything and like family members and that ambulance. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't know how to take it. I'm young at the time. I didn't really, um, it's hard to register. You know, someone's there every day and all of a sudden they're gone. And you've got to find out why you don't really know what's happened. Like, it's just, it's a very weird feeling, you know? Very weird and surreal feeling. For me, it was anyway. I had that with Wilma. My best mate died at the end of last year. Yeah. It's like, he's one minute, he's there, next minute. Gone. Like, just, and it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very surreal death, man. Very, very surreal. And, um, yeah, I appeal to all the, all the uh, fallen soldiers, man. Seriously, it's a, it's a hard life sometimes. But anyway, so, my friend got stabbed over a little bit of weed. Imagine the story now, yeah? 
it, someone got sold something and the person wasn't happy with it. So he come back and he just started stabbing everyone. And um, the guy wasn't from the area. The guy wasn't anybody. He was just a, a random guy, you know? And that was a shock to us all because Frankie was such a nice guy. I shouldn't even really use his name, but everyone knows who I'm talking about anyway. Uh, my guy, he's like, he was just a cool guy, you know? And uh, one of my best friends, one of my best friends at my house every day, and my girl, like, we're just cool, you know? And um, so that's happened. And then uh, I just want to say to the viewers, all the ex-cops we've interviewed on this channel have said that would not have happened if the war on drugs was ended and weed was legalized. And that's not because we want le weed legalized, we want everyone out doing it. That's because it ends, it takes it out of the criminal sector. Mm hmm People aren't showing up and getting shorted and getting soul bunk and getting upset and stabbing each other. Mm -hmm. If it's all re regulated mm -hmm. and restricted and legal and sold from a genuine place, all the cops that die, all the customers that die over this senseless war on drugs and all that money that could be then used to go after the predators. All right. And just to touch on that as well, and for, for public services as well, we're trying to get, we're trying to have better stuff. If you legalize weed, you can take the money you make from that and it can get put into public services as well, you know? For more education exactly. and less incarceration. Exactly, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the green dream. Anyway, <laughs> so um, at this time, I'm active. I'm active. My house, um, I'm selling drugs and I'm uh, doing commercial burglaries. There was a group of us and we used to just terrorize basically the whole of England, you know? The whole, it didn't, it didn't matter. If these, wherever these certain items were, we would go and we'd get them whatever it was so i was constantly getting arrested my house was constantly getting raided all the time all the time but i was a drug dealer and i was a lazy drug dealer the reason why i was a drug dealer mostly was because i love money back then i was all about the money oh i do not want to be a drug dealer but i knew drug dealers got money so okay cool drug dealers get money they get girls too i like girls i'm doing that that's what i'm doing you know so i'm selling coke and i'm selling this and i'm selling that anyway i get a knock on the door and uh about seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, for some reason, I I'm never up at them times. My mum's up getting up for work and my sister was mostly at work already by then. So I, uh, I, uh, I'm like, mum, I get it. Because it was a loud knock, like a dude, like an intimidating knock. And I'm like, the bloody old knocks like that. He's like, um, postman anyway. I opened the door. It was not the postman. It was the police. Yeah. And he'll run through my house and they take all my stuff. They arrest me. And I'm like, fuck. So now I'm uh, on bail for drugs and I go out, I do a few more bits. And I get arrested again for um, a commercial burglary. Um, a big one as well. Would have been like so much money. Anyway, but I got arrested for that. And um, I was on bail for the drugs. And the person I was arrested with was on home leave from prison. So, you know, you get like a home leave for three days to try and rehabilitate you, get you back. And my mate was coming out. He wanted money. We was all young and dumb back then. And um, yeah, so we both got arrested and um, sent to prison now. <clears throat> I'm in prison a week, maybe. And, um, you know, I know everyone, especially back then, all me and my mates went to prison. It was just a thing, you know, just a thing. Still is kind of now, you know, not with me, but a lot of my friends were in prison doing big sentences and all that kind of stuff. So um, someone's like, yo, Lazar, Lazar. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, yo, did you hear my man? He got killed. And I'm like, say it again. Because I'm thinking he's talking about my friend who um, we just, I just spoke about. And they're like, yo, yeah, my man's been killed. And I'm like... No way. Now, two of my friends have been killed in the space of mm, four weeks, maybe. Murdered as well with knife. Yeah. And it's just from, from not experiencing that to having that. And I'm like, bloody hell, man. You know, like life's crazy. But you, when you're younger, you just. It's almost like you're not as emotional to it, you know, because it's like it's, it's just new stuff that's happening to you. You know, so um, I get sentenced anyway. I got four years and blah, blah, blah. So they moved me to another prison now only. And uh, now I get to only, I'm starting my sentence. Like, it couldn't have been three months into my sentence. I can't go to even my funerals, uh, my friend's funerals, because they're not close family. And um, so, yeah, that was a bit of a kick in the teeth, but it's the life, the things you pay for in this life, you know? Uh, so um, one day, I'm mostly waiting to go to the gym or something, and then a, a screw, her name was Miss Goodfella. She was such a nice officer. She was, she was just cool. She was cool. Everyone loved her, Yeah. And she's like, oh, you're right, Lazar, you want to come down quickly when you talk to her? Now, I know what that means. I'm in trouble for something. I've done something. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. I'm not I'm cool. I'm like, miss, I haven't done anything. She's like, no, Lazar, we just need to... And that's the thing. They normally get you out of your cell. But then I started thinking, if they wanted to take me out of the cell, they would have just come and took me. They wouldn't have sent Miss Goodfella. You know, so I'm like, all right, cool. 
So I go downstairs now. And now there's a, like, you go downstairs to the office and all the officers, like, no one's even looking at me. It's just Miss Goodfellow, all like sad eyed in there. And I'm like, what the fuck is this about? Yeah. She's like, Lazar, you can come with me. Now, to go to the block, you have to go to the end of the corridor and do it right. I'm like, yeah, no, nope. standing on the ground. I'm like, I'm not, I haven't done anything. She's, and she's just being cool with me. Like, no, Lazar, blah, blah, blah. The officers ain't saying not a word to me. And I'm like, what is this? This is strange as hell. <coughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm going to come with you, Miss Goodfellow. So I go with Miss Goodfella. We walk all the way down the landing and we do a left. I'm like, a left? Like the block's on the right. I'm like, okay then, well, this is good. So now I've relaxed a bit. I'm like, oh yeah, Miss Goodfella, blah, blah, blah. We're talking. But she's not saying too much. She's just like, mm, mm hmm yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Anyway, the, if, you go, if you've ever been to Only, you know I was on E-Wing. And, and it's a long corridor. It's long, man. It's a really long corridor. And um, we get to the chaplaincy. Your boy's not religious. I'm not uh, anything like that. I wasn't signed to any religion in jail. So I'm like, the chaplain, I'm like, what are we doing here? And she's like, we just need to go inside quickly. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this? Yeah, I was just lost at this time. But I'm at my prison cell, whatever, decent. So um, I get in there, I'm looking around and that. And then I double take, and that's my mum. <laughs> what the fuck is my mum doing in prison? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what's going on? Like, you, you, this is unreal, right? You know? So, um... My mum's like, oh, you're right, Dad. My mum is always trying to be positive. I think that's where I get most of my positive energy from, my mum, you know. She's always positive. She's always trying to, go to put a good spin on things. She's always trying to do the right thing. She's a good person. She puts other people first. And I think, you know, that's why I've been off of me now, finally. But anyway, so I get there. And my mum's like, sit down, Mr. Lazada. Priest is there and that. And I'm like, okay, what's happening? I'm like, mum, everything good, yeah? I'm going through everyone i'm like i've got i got a child at that time i'm like how's lauren how's my sister how's nan how's chris that's my mom's boyfriend i'm like bro i asked about everyone i spoke to my dad i'd left a message on his voice machine three days before she's like no everyone's fine so then i'm like so what are you doing here she's like well the other day no one can get through to your dad Blah blah blah. This that the other. I'm like, yeah. I spoke to him the other day on the phone. She was like, yeah. Well, um, he's been found dead in um in his house. And I'm like, my dad had bought a house. You no know one knows a big market um housing bubble market in um 2001, I think it was. Anyway, he bought a house within a year. He sold it for 120. So he bought a new house and he's doing well. He was a social worker. He was really like, you know, just doing okay in his life. So for me to hear that, I'm like, what? And I'm like, are you sure? Because if everyone has ever experienced suicide in their life from anyone in their family, you'll know that is such a head fuck because you just don't, you like that person's fine to you. You know, like they may be a bit peed off. They may not have what they want in life, but like us all, but you never think they, anyone's going to go to that extent, you know? And I'm like, what? No way. And then like with Chaplin, see, once they give you this info, there's not much else they can do. So the mom's sitting there and I'm like, in shock and I'm like okay then they're like okay that's it enough blah 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 so after 10 minutes like my mum says goodbye and that and I say goodbye I'm still in shock I'm just thinking in that and I'm like okay this is weird like this my dad's dead and then me and Miss Goodfella we get outside the chaplaincy I feel normal I feel normal I'm walking down all of a sudden walking down the corridor back to the thing I'm just thinking all of a sudden I start crying I'm not really a crying person like that. I don't really shed too many tears and uh, but bro I broke down on that corridor and even Miss Goodfella, like she was holding me like I was a, a son or something, you know, just embracing me. I wasn't a bloody prisoner, prisoner there. She wasn't a prison officer there. We were just two humans embracing each other. She was consoling me, you know, and I could feel her tears on the back of my little bald head and that. And I'm just like, yo, this is messed up. And people like, well, for me anyway, I learned that this life of crime, it cost me so much stuff that I didn't put into the equation. So much stuff that I didn't value. And then when all these sudden certain things happen to you, certain opportunities are missed in that, and, 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 and you realize the person you become, you're like, oh my God. Yeah, prison is a really, really, really bad place, especially when you're experiencing death in that. And, um, and you can't even go and support. Like the only funeral I've ever been to in my life is my dad's. And I was in handcuffs and like, they wasn't even going to release me into the thingy because I was a security risk. So I'm always high risk when I go to prisons for fighting officers and just being an arsehole and being un... Um, um, just not being cooperative at all. <laughs> at all, you know? Like, um, it's a proper unreasonable person. So even down to that, they wasn't even going to let me go to my dad's funeral, you know? But and when I did go, I'm handcuffed and then there's a chain going to one, a chain going to the other, and there's an officer behind you. Yeah, it's not a good look. My dad had his work colleagues there. 
And and that was my like me since like seeing my dad off. Do you know what I'm saying? I wish I could have done it in better circumstances. But when you risk your freedom and when you gamble your freedom, you gamble everything. You gamble the people that love you. Like you just gamble everything. So just 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 do the quick reminder if you're out there in the life, you know, some things you're gambling with you don't even realize they're important to you until they're taken away from you, and then and then you can think about it. You know. Getting transported then back from the funeral to the prison. What was going through your head? Okay, now I had these young officers, yeah, that were, uh, that I was handcuffed to. And I don't know if they were awkward or they'd never done this before, but they was making a lot of jokes, you know? Like, and I'm here, I'm a bit of a people pleaser, yeah? I just like to just keep everyone cool in that. But and uh, by that time, I'd had a lot of time to think about my dad. And it, with suicide, it's just, you have so many questions, so many questions. With death, you can like, you know, kind of rationalize it out. But with suicide, it's like, could I have done something? What was he thinking? Was it because of this? Was it because of that? And you just, you just ask yourself questions you know you're never getting the answer to. You're never going to get the answer to. Hopefully there's an afterlife and you can know. But then at the same time, if there isn't, then you're going to be at peace anyway. But my point is that you just ask yourself questions you're never going to get the answer to. You're, and, and like, for me, it was anger. People used to ask me about my dad. I'd be like, yeah, the f idiot killed himself. Idiot. Like, I was angry that he would take his life. And he'd left us, like, letters. He left my sister a letter. Left me a letter. Um, and left us money as well. So it was all, like, almost planned and that and calm. And that's the other thing that annoyed me. Like, so you was actually thinking. So you was thinking. So you was rationalizing. And you still, but some people's pain, you know, this is this is a hard life. It's a hard life, you know. And it's not like if when they ask you about him, you could break down and cry in front of people in prison. You've got to put on a front. You've got to put you? on a front, and, and 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 not just that as well. Um, everything in the prison life goes on. What are you going to tell everyone? Oh, I'm not in the mood today. My dad died the other day. Oh no 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 no, not today. My dad. You know, like even though people 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 got their own shit going on, and like all these emotions you internalize, and then um. They just become something else. They become something else and they become a part of you you don't like or want. And you just got to like, for my advice for anyone that's got any unresolved issues is just go through them with your mind, talk about them. It really does help, man. Help me. I haven't spoke to anyone professional about it, but, you know, just rationalize it over and over again and realizing some people are in pain you can't even comprehend. So that's where I leave it at that. Cool. All right. So next one is jaw broke by a lifer. <laughs> See me. I must have this uh, expect. Do you know in your head you have this image of yourself? When I was in the streets, I just thought I was gangster. Like, 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 like. Even though I'm tall with glass and that, I was big. But like, like people didn't have the same image that I had of myself. You know. And um, so anyway, I'm in prison, one with scrubs at the time. I was arrested for a crime I didn't commit, people. I'm telling you, I did not commit this crime. But when you're in the life, you don't get the benefit of the doubt. You just, just look at your criminal history, look at the crime, and then like, yep, you did it. Go and prove your innocence, you know? It's another part of the life that you just got to be so careful of, you know? Because being in jail for something you didn't do is... That six months was the hardest time in my life because you don't know if you're going to get 20 years, you don't know if you're going to get thingy and like oh well, anyway so i'm in jail for a robbery didn't do it and i'm smoking loads of ash everyone knows me in jail i'm the weed man i will either get drugs in on visits or i will buy drugs off someone but one of the one of the two is happening you know i don't smoke spice i don't take heroin i don't take sleeping tablets i don't take anything other than weed i don't even drink prison hooch i don't smoke burn even so i need my weed people <laughs> so um i'm getting it off some guy yeah he's a lifer at the time and lifers have a lot of extra perks and blah blah you know and um, it's easy for them to get back to prison. But he'd been recalled to prison because he was a lifer. And when you're a lifer, you always, whoever, got a life license. So he's kind of a big guy, but I'm bigger than him. It's kind of an old guy, but I'm like, I'm, I'm not like the man, but I'm, I'm cool with everyone. I'm hyped up in that, you know? So I'm buying ash of him, buying ash of him. And then um, it just got normal. The pattern was normal. So when he said he had more ash, I'm like, cool. I send the money to account. I go to my cell, make a phone call, and get the money to his account. Normally, I come out after dinner or lunch whenever you put the money in, and then they come and give you the ash. It was just a business, you know. But for this time, it was being a bit different with me. 
It, like, it was just, everything was being a bit long and, oh yeah, I sold the last bit because you didn't put the money in when you said and then he took it and my sentence so coming, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I know what it's like in prison. I've still got a couple of joints left anyway, so I'm okay. Now it's two days have passed and like nothing's happening. Now I'm starting to think like, what the hell? I'm like, you know what? Send back my money. When you get the ash, we'll do it again. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And like a bit about dinner time it was, I must've went up to him again because I'm thinking, have you sent that money back? And I, the SO, the SO literally walked up to him in front of me and be like, yep, you're going tomorrow. Get your ship tab, make sure your stuff packed for the morning. Now I'm looking at him and he's like, he's looking at me like he's been caught. Cool. And I'm like, you're going, yeah? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But now he's trying to like talk his way out of it. He's like, don't worry, I've got a mobile phone. I'll give you that if I can't sort the ash out. I'm like, well, when was you going to tell me this? What, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> and lifers, it's a, why you can trust a lifer more in prison than, than a normal person is because lifers, They'll have like 20 years in prison and they'll move around that prison and people will know what they're like. They'll know if they pay their debts. They'll know, you know, the guy had no scars on his face. He was, he seemed cool. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm thinking about it myself. Now, like I say, I was bullied as a kid, like a lot. And um, I've always got that sort of feeling, you know, like he's taking the piss out of me. He thinks I'm an idiot. They're laughing at me. I get that in my head. And that voice there, it takes me to a place just, just takes me somewhere else. So in the morning, I've got a plan. I'm getting two of the guys. Shout out to my pal, Richie. Yeah, Richie Islington. And uh, my other pal, I won't mention his name. And um, I met both of them guys in jail. And um, I've got a funny story about Richie. I'll tell you about that afterwards. And um, I'm like, boys, this guy's tried to rob me. I remember <laughs> I give everyone ash. Like, I just like to be high with people. I like, you know what I'm saying? I'm giving everyone ash. I'm like, we're going to go and get this geezer. He said he thinks he's going to give me the phone. After he gives me the phone, we're going to batter him. That was the plan, you know? So, <laughs> I, yeah. So I go down and he's on the twos landing. I'm on the fours. So I get the boys. Richie's young at that time. He's like 22. My other pal is young as well. He's like 24. And then, um, remember, this guy's alive, you know? So he's been in jail years. He's done his bits. He's not an idiot. And thinking back now, I would have left it because I'm messing with someone's freedom. But now, at the time, I was furious. I felt like I'd been mugged off and he's trying to rob me. So I got in this cell, but he knows my energy. He's like, what's happening, mate? I'm like, yeah, get all these, because he had a few people who were saying goodbye to him. I'm like, get all these out of the cell now. Yeah? I'm like, what, are you trying to rob me? I've, I'm winding myself up. I've wired myself up the whole night. Yeah? In my head, I'm going to batter him, do my thing, rare, rare, rare. In my head. Yeah? So I'm like, yeah, take, taking the piss. So I've swung for him. The geezer was like a box or something. The geezer ducked. I went, vroom! I've never had my jaw broken before, but you know when something's up. I was punched so hard, yeah? He punched one punch, you know? Punched me so hard here, yeah? My jaw was like, click, almost like a sound, but, but, you, but you feel it, you don't hear it. And I'm like, yeah, that was a, that was a broken jaw. So now I'm not trying to box with this guy because he's a boxer, I'm not. We're in a cell, so I'll grab him, I overpower him, fling him on the bed, yeah? Now I'm trying to fight him and I'm like, you know what, forget this, give me the phone. Took the phone, because he said he was going to give me the phone anyway, but I knew my jaw was in pain, in pain. And remember people, I'm on, I've got not guilty. I'm in prison for something I did not do. And this whole time is leading up to a trial where I've got to talk about my innocence. A month before my trial, my jaw's broke. <laughs> and I'm wired shut now. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I've been planning this for five months. My, my whole case, my whole freedom. Oh. My minimum sentence is 12 years if I get found guilty for something I didn't do. So I'm like, no way. And um, anyway, so I'm kind of a bit forward. So I go to the office. I'm like, my jaw really hurts. They're like, what happened, Lazar? I'm like, nothing, man. I just bloody woke up, fell out of bed, and blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, you fell out of bed, yeah? And they're, yeah, they're like, look, it doesn't look too bad. I went to see a doctor. That's no, fine. I go to um, uh, education now. I was with that guy I spoke to earlier, the high profile guy. Uh, me, him, and a couple others. <clears throat> um, and we're in there and we're talking. Colors, the rapper. There's a few of us, kind of like a few celebs in there as well. And my jaw is getting bigger and bigger. And I'm not really noticing it, but I'm just realizing it's harder to open my mouth more. I'm a talker, you can see. I talk, I talk, I talk. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mom. No, no, it's hard. I'm like, like my and I just see someone looking at me like, bro, you need to go to the doctor. My jaw had got big in it. So I got to the doctor, like, yeah, it's broke. And even when your jaw's broke, they still got to book in your appointment. It still takes about a week. So now I'm thinking three weeks before my thingy. Anyway, I um, got it all sorted just before my trial, which was, thank God, which I had my, my, my jaw wired and I couldn't even, oh my God, I couldn't even eat. Your boy loves to eat, people. I couldn't even eat properly. It was the worst time. Oh my God. And sometimes you go to talk, like wake up and you all, yeah, having your jaw broke was horrible. And uh, my, my jaw broke was horrible and I had it in prison and I was in a bloody cell where there was no windows, no windows. So it's like air vents and like you just, oh, and it's, it's 
form of torture. It really is. If you know about the air vents in prison, like they get as hot as ovens. They really do, man. <laughs> if you think if you're going to get sick in prison or have an accident and you're going to get to see a doctor like that, <laughs> you're in a dream world. <laughs> I had two weeks of shattered teeth before I got out of a prison. Oh. Two weeks before I see a dentist. Then they said to me, you have to eat like this. I remember they would bring the food to my cell. It wasn't even soft food. They would, um, uh, so I'd have to cut it up and I'd have to go out, open my mouth and try and put the food ah, at the back of my mouth and chew with these tooth because I had two smashed front teeth with nerve endings. <laughs> and because I wasn't given names, because I was new to the prison, I'd just been kicked out of the last prison for drug dealing. They're like, this guy's a problem. And uh, yeah, they left me for two weeks and it was horrible. It's horrible. So yeah, don't be expecting any sort of A&E treatment. <laughs> <laughs> What's the funny story about Richie? Oh, Richie. So with Richie now, like he's a good guy, you know, we all get what I found that with the criminal world is there's two types of people. They're straight up criminals and most of them are assholes and bad people. And there's, there's a good people that just get caught up in the life. I think I was one of the good people that got caught up in the life. Yeah. And I think Richie was as well. So I met him in prison. And when you go to prison, if people from the same area as you, oh, what are you from here? You know, this person, blah, blah, blah. That's how me and Richie got uh, involved and um op me richie and op op does the live what is it the wise monkey podcast it's a new thing anyway but yeah so shout out to um op doing your thing bro and uh so yeah richie got with a group of boys and they got away with this you know people they actually got away with this but oh, anyway ah oh, life eh so they've gone to selfridges dressed as muslims with burkas on full burkas on but sledgehammers underneath the burkas but they've gone as women you know so they've gone into west end i mean west end selfridges and it's like one of the biggest stores in uh london they've gone in there they've gone to whatever floor the um this uh showroom was gone in there and just started like pulled out sledgehammers just started smashing up cabinets smashing everything and they took about i don't know um, two million pound worth of stuff and people were screaming you can type it on youtube you see people running left and right um and uh they got away with all the goods people they 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 they, 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 they terrorized the shop they got away with it and um one person one person you know had uh someone's phone had everyone's number who was on the move as their legit ne numbers names so imagine you was on it it'd be like sean atwood daniel lazar so they just when they arrested that person they went through his phone got all the names cell sighted mm. them they was all at the spot and my mate was like nah forget that i'm going not guilty some of them got eight years, some of them got nine years. My mate not, not guilty and got 15 and he's out. Well, we ate, he's out next month. Shout out to Rich. I'm going to try and get him to do his story. But um, a lot of people don't like talking about their, their past, you know? So, uh, but yeah, that's uh, Richie, man. It's, uh, it's a madness, this world, this life that we live in. Well, what about they tried to murder me? Oh, yeah. uh, that was the one where um, they actually, um, when I got hit with the um, thingy there. And obviously there's one story I can't, the main story of everyone knows who tried to kill me out there, but I can't talk about that on camera. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Guilty until proven innocent and tattoo trauma. Ah, oh, man. That was a hard one. Like, I've, like I say, I was talking about it before, if you've ever been in prison, yeah, if ever, and you've done it, there's a sort of understanding, a sort of, okay, well, I've done it, I shouldn't have done this, and a sort of rationalization. When you haven't done it, and you get arrested for a crime, boof. That psychology is horrible. That psychology is horrible. So, uh, one day, I'm with my baby mum, my, my baby mum now, but she wasn't at the time, but with my girlfriend at the time. And uh, I was living at her house and I started getting phone calls. My phone started going, yeah, uh, police are looking for you. Yeah, this door's been kicked off. That door's been kicked off. I'm like, what? I'm like, for what? I hadn't done anything uh, that they would know about. Yeah. And it was like a robbery squad. And I'm like, robbery squad? They're like, yeah, they really, really got a hard on for you, Dan. And I'm like, I'm rattling my brain, trying to think of any old stuff. And I'm like, nope, been prison, just got out, blah, 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 nothing. So I, um, I'll ring up the officer in charge. He's like, yeah, just come down. We just want to talk to you. And I'm like, calm. <laughs> I don't need a solicitor for this. They just want to talk to me. This happens all the time. Like all my little cousins were active. Like they would rob in Hatton Gardens, smash and grab, like everything. So, and all their second names are the same as mine, Lazar. So, and, and they all you kind of use as a, Lazar as their first name. So it's like, yeah, Lazar done this, Lazar done that. And I was the main one. So my house would get raided all the time. So I was kind of used to it. Um, so I go to the police station there, yeah? 
And I don't have a solicitor because everyone knows that solicitors are long and they're just there. To, you know, you just need a barrister really unless you've actually done something and I hadn't done anything. I was a fool. You always need a solicitor. <laughs> you always need a solicitor. <laughs> you always need a solicitor because sometimes you're trying to be helpful, but you can um, just not be helpful to yourself, you know, which is the main thing to do. So I've gone in there. They're like, uh, Mr. Lazar, you're arrested for this, that, the other. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's get interviewed. Let's just sort this out. They're like, do you want to solicit? Are they like, no. I'm like, no, I don't want nothing. I just want to get in there. And they're being cool with me. We're talking and that. And then they start showing me the footage. And I've got a distinctive walk. Everyone who knows me knows what I'm saying. Isn't it? I've got a distinctive walk, yeah? And um, this person had my walk. So I'm like, okay, but he's a bit shorter than me, a bit more stockier than me. But he had glasses on. And he was kind of like, I'm mixed as well. And he was kind of mixed. But it was like a black and white photo. It wasn't coloured. So I'm like, okay. And this was like in my area, in Queen's Crescent. If you know Camden, you know Queen's Crescent is around the corner. And um, there was a chemist there. So the guy has gone in and I'm looking at the footage. They're saying, explain what you can see. So I explain everything. There's someone walking in there. There's, there's someone behind him, blah, blah, blah. And they robbed the gaff, yeah? But it's a proper violent robbery as well. They grabbed the guy over the counter. They've got him in there like a chokehold. The man's old as well. They go through his pockets. They take his watch. They go through the till and take 20 pounds. So the whole robbery was for like 200 quid. <clears throat> And I'm like, yeah, well, that wasn't me. I explained everything. They're like, all right, cool. Are you happy to do a identity parade? I'm like, of course. This gets me free. Now I can go home after this, smoke some weed and relax. You know what I'm saying? Uh -oh. Now, you've got to understand, people, when you have an ID parade, if you have a solicitor there, they will look at the photos that the police are presenting to, to put you in the lineup with. But because I never had a solicitor, they chose people that did not look like me. I was the only one that looked like me. <laughs> 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 so is it this guy or no one you know like but I didn't know that at the time you know what I'm saying because obviously I am a, uh, I'm, I'm in the police station and so I got picked out an identity parade for a crime I didn't commit from a person that's never seen me before how is that even possible how is this even possible I'm like they're like yeah Miss Lazar so we're, you've been picked out and we're going to charge you for the thing I'm like what bro I don't cry in police stations I don't Get emotional because every time I've been nicked, I've done it. <laughs> I wasn't the best. Like, like, like I'd got caught a lot, you know. Like you do, you get caught in that, and I'd known. So you just, but this one, no, this was different, and it was serious. It was a robbery. I've already been jailed for armed robbery before, so the the, the starting guidelines like twelve years, and I'm like. The fuck, bro? I'm crying in their cell and everything. I'm frustrated, and I'm like, I'm trying to just um change my life at them times there. But I didn't know. And this was like 2012 or 11. But I didn't know what to do or change. I just know I'd, like, I'd been messing up somehow, you know. But I didn't have anything to change. I still had bad thoughts in my head. I'd still, I was still in a bad place. So I'm thinking like, what the hell? What the hell? What the hell? Was it even worth trying to change? Is it even worth doing this? I'm trying to be a good guy, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they say, you're going to prison. <laughs> and I'm like... Yeah, this is bad this time because now I've got to tell everyone as well what I'm in for. Like, what are you in for? Oh, there was a robbery and there was two people and they robbed some guy for 200 quid. It just sounded like crackhead shit. But it wasn't me. So now everyone's like asking me, oh, what are you in for, Lazar? What are you in for? I'm like, I didn't do it. There was a robbery, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, so what evidence have they got? And I'm like, I got picked out an ID parade. And then like, oh, what? So you didn't do it, but the person knows what you look like and you've been in jail for robbery. Like, this is all pointing to me. Where was it? Uh, around the corner from where I live. Our okay, Lazar, yeah, he didn't do it, no. So no one's believing me. Even people outside are sketchy, yeah? But the one thing you'd know about me is, one, I'd never do anything without a mask. And two, I'd never, ever, 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 ever do a robbery in my own area like that, you know? It was just, it was just like, I would never do that. So uh, everything was going against your boy, you know? Everything. And I'm, so I'm telling people, I'm telling people, I'm telling people. And um, my previous is long, so I'm getting no bow I have to be on remand in prison so I'm thinking of all the kind of stuff now they have a perfect shot of this person the guy walks in to the camera and looks at it like the cameras this is the camera I'm the person the guy that's it there's no bloody it's a selfie the guy basically took a selfie yeah and give it to the police yeah so I'm like this is good because now there's a thing called so facial mapping so they're going to get his bone structure get my bone structure do all the frequencies and I'm going to get released <laughs> <sighs> if only it happened that way with them. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've requested it. And even my barrister said, Mr. Lazar, because he doesn't know me, he just knows my criminal past. And he's like, are you sure you want to do this? I'm like, yes, because it was not me. He's like, okay, no problem. So we request for facial mapping. 
and um, there's like a system of definitely not you, possibly you, likely you, um, um, most likely you, definitely you. So we go through, we get the technology, it comes back, most likely you. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I, I just couldn't believe it. And now it's getting worse now because everyone's asking on the prison on the landings, what, did, what happened with the thing? Like, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, come back, um, it's me. <laughs> But it's not me, you know, like, like trying to get this out to people. It was horrible. And then um, when I came to court, that's when people, <coughs> the police's evidence was lies. The judge threw it out. It was called, I can't remember the word in, basically. Oh, yeah, I do remember the word in. One was called a formal identification and the other one is called a non-formal identification. So a formal identification is, is a, uh, excuse me, uh, officer, come here. Like, I'm a police officer, so I'm asking another officer to come here, and I, do you know this person? That's a formal identification. You're asking someone to come over and look at the screen. That's what one officer said. The other officer said, um, yeah, I walk in past, I looked at the screen, I know, that, I know Daniel Lazar well, I know his whole family, and I just said, yeah, that's Daniel Lazar. Now, both of those things are two different things. One officer said he called him over, the other said he walked past. Because of that, they couldn't use that in evidence. And um, then they released the people who I was lined up with, Oh my God, there was like two 60 year old men, like a proper Indian man, a black guy, and me. You know, like, 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 like they, 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 they were basically pointing fingers, you know? And then, um, so they threw that evidence out. They said, no, we can't allow this evidence because this is um, unfair to Mr. Lazar. So when they actually, so all they had now was the witness. So how does this witness know you? Okay, my girlfriend worked on the same road. And she worked in a place called, I can't remember, it was a nursery, a private nursery in Hampstead, yeah? And on the corner was a chemist. One day we'd gone into the corner to get a pregnancy test because she thought she was pregnant. She wasn't pregnant. That's where the woman recognised my face from. And so obviously I told the story to my barrister, but this is all the evidence now they had. And um, now they're trying to go on it. And I had like four witnesses, like the manager of the nursery, two of my girlfriend's work colleague, and my girlfriend who I picked up saying I was there. And now the barrister has got so into this, he's trying to make the story that I've collected my girlfriend, I've walked with her, I've run off, done a robbery, and then run back with my girlfriend. Obviously, they all knew that was just far-fetched rubbish. So they threw the case out, you got, uh, got not guilty. I was so happy. I'd spent six months on Romando, and it was stress. You know, like my hairline, I'm sure it started there. Afterwards, it was like up here. I'm, like, I'm telling you, it's stress. Getting arrested for something you didn't do. And even if you have to do the prison sentence, like you've got to be a strong man to do that, you know? You've got to be a strong man because that mental game there, that mental anguish of trying to convince people, oh man, oh man, it's horrible. Yeah, 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 it's a hard one. What about the tattoo trauma? <laughs> okay. You see how my life links in? There's so many different things, but they all just link in and it's just a messed up thing. <laughs> so this girl, my baby man at the time, yeah, she had a couple of tattoos. Now me, I don't have no tattoos. Well, I have now, but I didn't have no tattoos. I don't really, like, I don't have nothing against them, but it's just, I don't want them on my body sort of thing. My mum was always against it as well and I'm a bit of a mummy's boy. So um, she's come up to visit me, yeah? And she's got Lazar, on the back of her lair. <laughs> and she told me about it. And then she's got Lazar Daniel there. And I'm like, oh, okay, you got a tattoo. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm going to wait for you now. When you're in prison, that's what you want to hear. You want to see your girlfriend's got a tattoo of your name and all that stuff. And I did not ask for this. And I'm thinking I could get 12 years. So this may actually, you know, be a good thing. Yeah. Anyway, I get out and all that other stuff. I get them not guilty, like I say. And I told her, yeah, I'll get a tattoo of your name when I get out. You know, blah, 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 all that stuff. I've never had a tattoo in my <laughs> life, people. I just don't. Yeah. And um, so now I'm out, yeah? She's got her tattoo and now everything's fine. We're not talking about nothing. And then one day it's back to normal again. She's like, so where's your tattoo then? I'm like, I'm a people pleaser, you know? I'm like, I'll, I'll get it today if you want, you know? She's like, yeah, I'll pay for it. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, cool. And then like, she's, well, she's got it all set up, mate, yeah? So anyway, I get down to this place. I'm not even going to mention it because they ruined my life. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's close and it's close. It's in Camden, yeah? I go there and there's a punk woman there. Yeah, we go through the doors. They're like, what do you want? And um. They, I said I wanted a name, and they're like, okay, you need to speak to her because she does the names and stuff like that. So I'm like, all right, cool. She's like, um, I'm like, I want a tattoo of my girlfriend's name, blah, blah, blah. She just looks at my girlfriend, looks at me. She's like, okay, sit down here. So I sit down in that. I don't really know about tattoos. They're painful, blah, 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 the other stuff. I didn't even want this tattoo. So <laughs> it's not even that arm. I don't even know. It's this arm. But like, so I'm like this 
And then like she's she's doing all this stuff and she's like, so what kind of font do you want? Kind of blah blah blah. You can kind of can you see it? Can you see how big one letter is? Bro? Yeah, yeah. That's one letter. She advertised everything on me, <laughs> this woman, yeah. So um I'm like, yeah, yeah, just go for it. So it was like on my arm, you know? On my bloody arm. Not on the wrist there, just a little something there. No, my whole <laughs> arm, like I'm a bloody advertising board, yeah. I'm a people pleaser, so I'm letting her do her thing. I've looked at it and I'm like, go and do it. I'm like, oh, it's pain, it's pain, it's pain, it's pain, it's pain. Bro, I look back at my arm about an hour later. I've got, I'm, I'm a billboard. <laughs> KT, till death do us part. It could till death do us part. It was like a whole essay. <laughs> now I'm looking at my arm. Kate's just smiling. They charge me 300 quid and I'm like, yeah, this was definitely not the best idea. Now, obviously, I'm like, at least it's done though. At least it's done. She can't stress at me no more. She can't say anything to me for the rest of my life, you'd think. Yeah. So um, I get a tattoo done. And um, you have to have it for a few days and that's so I can't go to the gym. Now I go to the gym. I've told no one about this tattoo. Only me and Kate know. I go to the gym and everyone just looks at my arm and like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, oh, it's tattoo. Like, I'll rub it off, man. You can't have that. I'm like, no, it's a tattoo. They're like, looking at each other like, what the fuck, bro? Like, what? Like, bro, I had this girl's name and within... Four months after that, we'd split up. <laughs> now I'm walking around with no money, a massive tattoo in the summer of someone who I'm not even with. <laughs> and it took me years to get the, to get this done over. And, he, and you know, like, oh my God. So you listen, people, don't get no tattoos of people. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. You don't need to write the name on you. You're not a chalkboard. <laughs> yeah. That was <laughs> Cousin kidnapped. Oh my God. So my little cousin's been through a lot, you know? Like, um, he's been through a lot, this guy. But you've got to remember people, when you're in this life, when you do these things, when you, when you put yourself up for recruit by gangs, by older people, trust me, they're using you for a reason. And it's not the reason you think. Then you may feel lost in this world. And older boys, they come and they show you love and you feel accepted. It's happened to me, but it's not the acceptance you're looking for or you need. Anyway, getting into the story. <clears throat> I had family. They were from up north. Now, my family spread out all over England. Um, and um, my family in London, we got problems with certain other families and that we don't get along with everyone. Yeah, especially like we've got youngers, beefing brothers. And then before you know it, it just comes mad. And certain families don't like certain families. Now, my family's not good at listening to like rules and stuff. So we get this cousin, won't say her name or anything, but she comes down. We give her rules of who to stay away from, what to do, what not to do. She broke every wall within like two days. Yeah, and she's like older, she's like my age as well. She broke every wall in two days. She's with people we don't like, like let's all mixed up. And now her son is holding guns. Yeah? Guns, you know, he's 13 or 12 years old and he's holding guns. She don't know about this. Mum don't know about it, obviously. But we're telling him, listen, there's bad people out here that do bad things. And like, it's just crazy. It's not like where you're from. It's different. Cool. This guy, this kid, just like me, it's, it's got to be in the DNA or something. He thought, you know what? I'm holding guns for gang members. What can I do? What can I do? I can sell these guns for weed. So that's what he done. He sold gang members' guns for weed. <laughs> yeah. And then, and it wasn't even a lot of weed. Yeah, and, and and then I start to get phone calls from one of my little cousins. Like, yo, we've got a problem, this, that, the other. This has happened, this has happened. So I'm like, who is it? I'm hearing it. I'm like, I know them boys. It's cool. There's no problem there. I'll bring up. And we're talking. I'm not taking it too seriously because these lot know me. Yeah, and I know them. And uh, we don't really get along, though. But they know me. They know what I'm about and all that other stuff. And I'm like, whatever about. And... Um, but they're telling me to pay the money. They're like, look, just pay this and pay. I'm like, brother, you fucking dumb. I'm not paying nothing. I'm not paying nothing. Nothing's happened to my little cousin and all that other stuff. But I wouldn't take it too seriously. So I'd see their number calling me. I'd, I wouldn't answer. I wouldn't answer. I wouldn't answer. It's like, whatever, man. It's my little cousin. You shouldn't be giving little kids guns anyway, sort of thing. Idiots, yeah? So, um, one day I'm at home playing computer, smoking weed in my own head. I hear, boop, boop, bang on the door. I'm like, huh? What the fuck is that? Yeah, it's mostly police or something there, yeah? I'm like, who is it? It's my auntie with like a couple of other my family members. All women though. And like, it's like 11.30 at night. I'm like, like my life is so random when this stuff happens. I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, yeah, so, um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, fuck. I just used his name. It's all right. We can delete that out. Timestamp that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my little cousin was um, uh, kidnapped. And I'm like, no way. And I'm like, uh, so what happened? And like, yeah, listen, they want, now they want like a lot of money, like two, three grand. I'm like, well, we only sold two guns and there was, uh, no, man, that didn't make sense, this, that, the other. So now I'm talking to them, but I'm taking them seriously now. I'm like, listen, boys, blah, 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 this, that, the other, this, that, the other. They're like, yeah, nothing's happened to him anyway. He's cool, just pay the money. And I'm like, I ain't got that money to pay you, boys. I'm like, you know what, yeah? Just drop my cousin off, we'll work it out, yeah? They're like, all right, cool. So I'm like, look, that's all I can do. I'm not getting involved in this. I'm not putting my name in this, none of this kind of stuff, yeah? So my auntie and them, they go off. And they're speaking to the guy. They're going to go and get my little cousin back. And then, uh, so they get my, um, what do you mean? They go to a meet now. It's in Queen's Crescent, just by the bakery opposite the uh, post office now. Yeah. But it's at night. It's like 11 to 30 at night, but there's big cameras everywhere. And um, they've told us they haven't done anything to him. Yeah. So obviously when we're just like, cool, no harm, no foul sort of thing. Anyway, they tortured him for 15 hours. They'd smashed him up, battered him, hurt him, fucked him up bad. He's only a young kid, you know, and these guys like, 20 something and they're doing this to a young kid over two guns and uh i even said nah these, they won't do nothing they'd, they'd be fine sort of thing and um so the guy the the gang members were talking to me yeah but i wasn't involved in the actual meet yeah so when they've turned up they think i'm gonna be there with my friends so when they've they've all pulled up in cars and jumped out with machetes and stuff yeah thinking it's gonna go down my auntie just screamed rape that's what they told me when they came back yeah uh, like one of they come out with a kid, so they run over, grab the kid, and uh, my auntie's run off. That screaming rape because they they was expecting to get paid. They didn't get paid, and they'd run off. But yeah, in a nutshell, that was it. My um cousin was holding stuff. My little cousin, and he wasn't from London. And um, easy pickings, you know. It doesn't matter about anything if you are easily led, vulnerable gang members, um, criminals. They will exploit you. They will exploit you for your weakness. They will exploit you for you not knowing about the streets. And then, you know, my mate's son was arrested for murder. Blew someone's face off at 15. 15 years old. Like, the guy's my age, um, my mate, and his son's in jail for the next 20 years. My other little brother's mate's in jail for murder. Got arrested when he was, like, 15. Got 19 years. Like, these, like I'm telling you, man, like, these young kids out there doing all this kind of type of craziness for the respect of these older people who are just making a joke of you. And making you throw your whole life away, you know? Did the gang members leave it at that? Or did they try and Oh, no, 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 no. Again? Okay, so what happened was, because obviously um, they was talking about the police as well. My um, auntie was and my auntie's mum. My, um, my cousin's mum, uh, the one who was kidnapped. So what happened was, um, after that, um, people got arrested. And um, I was a bit confused. I'm like, if you're going to call the police, why get me involved sort of thing? But uh, people got arrested, but um, my cousin wasn't willing to give any evidence. So he threw the trial, basically. When he went to court, he was like, nope, nope. Just swearing at the judge and just being a bad witness. So um, yeah, nothing happened with that. And um, I, I know the people, like it was just, you know, sometimes you can do dumb stuff. When you're young, you can, um, you can just make bad choices. A lot of us do. We've all done bad things to good people. And um, Maybe that's how they chalk it down. I don't know. But yeah, man, it's just um, gang activity. There's a gang war in Camden right now. It's going on. People are dying left and right. And um, is, it, is it like different neighborhoods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, postcards. We've been like half a mile of each other. And they're really killing each other. They're really, really killing each other. And like they're successful rappers. And like one group has like killed loads of them. And they're putting all the dead people they've killed on projectors and the music video. But it just goes on and on on and on and it's getting just so serious in camden and um yeah 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 it's, it's really again decriminalize drugs take it out of the hands of the criminals then they can't buy that's the guns it they can't buy all this shit. stuff and you've got to remember people that with the drugs as well it is um the market is created by it being illegal <laughs> if it was legal there'd be no market you don't see people on the street selling tomatoes in the shady corners like you want to buy some tomatoes got a can of beans here no it's just you know Anyway, the media doesn't tell you most of this knife crime, drug gang rivalries. Mm -hmm. All right, so first kilo of coke. Yeah, see me, I've always been a stoner. And they say don't get high on your own supply, but I broke that rule as soon as I become a drug dealer because all I wanted to do was sell drugs so I could buy weed, do nothing, and just sit about and be cool, you know? 
<sighs> that was the plan anyway. It just takes you to other place in life, you know? And before you know it, you're just in a crazy situation. But yeah, so um, I was with a crime family. Everyone knows the crime family I was with. There was, there was a group of us, you know? And we was all doing bits and we was all part of one thing. And uh, I just had a lot of people buying weed off me. Like I'm saying, I knew everybody. Everybody and everybody. And I just had a lot of people buying weed off me. So, you know, I'd make a lot of money for this family. And uh, when you're making a lot of money for, for someone, for a criminal, for whoever, that's cool. But they are constantly trying to find out how you can make more, how you can do more, how you can risk your freedom more, and how you can put yourself out there on the front line so they can benefit while they sit at home with their family, you know? So like, yo, you, you like, uh, what, what's going on? Like, they called me, actually. He's like, what's going on? Need to come see her. I'm like, yeah, yeah, fine. Unless it was for money or something. I don't really know. They always want to come see her for something. And he's like, look, we can do a Coke. And I'm like... I don't really take coke like that. I mean, I, I'd party now and again, but like I was never really in the scene like that. I was a stoner. But obviously I'm a drug dealer and that's drugs, isn't it? And I know like being a coke dealer's up there. So I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I can sell coke. I couldn't, didn't have too many people, but my co D, my part, he was more into that. And um, so I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And obviously I think I was charged like 37 or 38,000 at the time, which was kind of good at the time. I think it was like 50 now. So I don't even know. It's been a long time. But, um, so he called me to a spot and he's like, right, this is what we're going to do now. We open it. Now, if anyone's ever had a kilo of Coke straight from a board, you know how it comes, yeah? It comes all wrapped up in tape, tapes up, taped up, taped up. You finally get through the tape. That takes about 10 minutes, yeah? And then there's a seal, just a, a seal that cannot, can be broken, but has not been tampered with. So you can see once you open it, it's like that smell of felt tip pens. You know, felt tips when you open a marker and it's got that potent smell. That's what this was, this Coke. It was all shiny and stuff. I'd never seen anything like it. I felt like such a gangster. In that moment, I felt like, yep, I've reached it. I'm, I'm here now. I'm that guy, you know? I'm that guy, yeah? But I didn't really have too many sales for it and um, didn't really have nowhere to put it. And I didn't really, I wasn't in that life sort of thing, you know? But I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> I'm a people pleaser. I don't give you a drug dealer, whatever. I'm a people pleaser. <coughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, so he, he takes all the stuff because the person I was dealing with, the people in the family, they were pop on point. So all the rappers or anything, they would take away, you know? So I'm left there with this now. I bring my power, tell him what we're doing. I didn't know about mixing coke or anything. I'm just by giving it out almost raw, you know, to do all types of different people. And I'm leaving it with one of my friends. He's not a part. He's like me. He's a stoner, you know? I won't mention his name, but um, and I've just left it in a, like, a Tesco bag. I've done it up in a knot. Like, yeah, that's secure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so I've got a kilo of Coke in there and I'm taking, I'll go there and I'll send people there to go and get bits. Yeah, go, like it's weed, but it's definitely not weed, bro. Yeah. So you're going to take an ounce. Go and do this. Now, people that smoke weed, they might nick a couple of joints. People that take Coke, it's a bit different. You know, they can, uh, sometimes they may not be in control of themselves. Sometimes when you're you think, yeah, yeah, I'll get all back tomorrow. You wake up, you're like, I haven't got no money. But anyway, so I've left it at my mate's house there and I'm just, every week when you're dealing with certain people in, in in crime and they're giving you drugs on consignment otherwise tick otherwise basically pay the money later they want their money every week so I used to get 10 kilos every week and I'd pay 3200 3, per kilo which is 32000 for 10 but now my debt's gone up to 70 grand a week and I don't really have no cocaine things like that but my Cody helped me out with a few people he knew lots of people so we was doing and it was good stuff so we was doing alright <clears throat> But my life was hectic at this time. I was kind of in debt because I was just living the life, you know, you're just out and about. Like you just believe everything. Like you're taking losses. People are robbing certain spots. So like you're taking losses, but that doesn't matter. You don't come with excuses. You don't come with a list of reasons why you can't pay a crime family money because you will end up in a canal or something. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you've got to do what you've got to do. So I knew I was falling behind here. And I'm thinking, I'll just make it back with a Coke. <clears throat> yeah, the, that's the dream world it doesn't happen so I am um, I'm getting the coke now but imagine I'm selling weed and if something bad happens I may lose three four hundred pounds yeah with coke it's a totally different thing you know totally different thing and uh, I just wasn't prepared for it and uh, I, I carried on doing it but that that also increased my debt and it made a lot of people around me cokeheads because I didn't know they were stealing off me I do when I come out of prison because they was all fucking <laughs> Cokeheads, and I'm like, is that what happened? Is that how I got in debt so easily? Yeah, but like, 
yeah, it's a devil drug. And um, I was consistently getting kilos of coke for like three or four months. And I was just, I remember one time I was sniffing it. Yeah, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even do anything. I'm just sitting there. I'm just going like, I can't, like, can't verbalise anything. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, you fucked up in your life somewhere. You fucked up in your life. The fact that you're sitting there, you've got people ringing you for like 50 grand. Like you're thinking above, above that whole situation. And I swear to God, I was, a lot of the stuff was just me trying to get accepted. I just wanted people to accept me. You know, drug dealers, drug dealers in demand. Everyone wants to be around a drug dealer. Everyone wants a drug dealer. Everyone's got a drug dealer's number. And some of it was literally just acceptance, just not wanting to be on my own and just wanted to, people bring you up. You got this? Uh, yeah. You know, it's just a way of pleasing people, man. It sounds weird, but I just wanted acceptance most of the time. And that's where a lot of my criminal behavior came from. You know, you're not accepting. I agree with that because the whole community forms around you, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. You're the man. You're the man. And, and you're depend people are dependent on you. And then you, you start to get birds that you would never get. And you're like, you know what? Yes. <laughs> yes. I knew I was top sexy guy. I knew I was. You know? But then when you lose it all, you realize it was all a thingy. And now you're broke in prison and you've got to do it all by yourself. And there's no, no one to help you. Like, I'll do 10 weeks for you. You go out and sort yourself. No. No, they're on to the next one. How did that debt resolve itself? Oh, that debt was, um. see, now, with me, I'm always honest. I can never, ever be dishonest. And I struggled with this because I knew the answer to this. I knew the answer to this, but obviously YouTube never before I give it to you guys. And um, in life, we always want to be the top gangster. We always want to be, ah, done this. We want to come out on top, but we don't always come out on top, people. And sometimes the, you can have the fun. You can live that life. And the people around you, they pick up the pieces. Whether it's supporting you in prison, whether it's supporting your children because you can't, you're not around, whatever, whatever it is. So the long and the short of it is, this crime family, known them for years, known, known them well. You know, we, we, we were like, growing up, we was all one, yeah? But... When you get into this life, all them attachments of, ah, oh, yes, my mate and blah, 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 that's all out the window now because now you're dealing on a different level, yeah? So I got into debt. I got into a big debt. At one stage, with no money, I think the highest they got to was like £78,000 with no money, people. Can you imagine that? And like, <laughs> nowhere to go. You know, it was, it was, I was stuck at one stage. That's why I done a lot of bad stuff in Camden and my name got terrible. But um, yeah, so uh, we'd paid off bits and pieces of it, but there was a big chunk outstanding, like I think like 15,000. And it, got, it was getting very, very sticky for your boy. My life was on the line and it was, it was bad. And um, the people I had around me, they was all in prison at the time. So it was just me and like one other guy and this other guy, like it was just a bad situation. So my mum paid the money. It was like 15,000 and um, my mum actually paid the money. And this is the thing, people, yeah? This kind of thing happens a lot in the street. People play this big gangster role, but they haven't got the brains, the intelligence. They haven't got the, what it takes, you know? And I was one of those people that never had what it takes, but would always put myself in the position to try and do it, to always get in there and try and throw my hat in. But I'd end up in prison, bruv. <laughs> you know, like, but it's just this thing of what we do. And like, I tell people that, not because um, it makes me look good, because it doesn't. Not because of I'm proud of it, because I'm not. I'm ashamed of it, but because it's a part of me. And it's because of a situation that I never thought I would have found myself in when I was a criminal. Because I'm thinking, nah, dude, this, this will happen, this will happen, that will happen. The realisation is that kind of stuff doesn't happen. And your friends will send you to prison. Um... Your friends will take advantage of you and the pain will be inflicted nine times out of ten by your own circle. So, yeah, paying that debt to the drug dealers. Uh, I mean, some of it got paid in other ways, but the last bit of it was paid by my mum. And, uh, yeah. So another important message here from Daniel's story is family members. He's talked about the aunt grabbing the kid and screaming rape. Imagine what must have been going through her head at that moment. Armed gang members ready to just do anything. He's talked about his mom coming up with 15 grand, probably a big chunk of her life savings, I imagine. 
my parents remortgaging their house to come up with a lawyer because I was facing 200 years. Otherwise, I'd still be in prison right now if they hadn't come up with that money. My mum flying 5,000 miles to visit me in prison, looking all broken in the visitation room. And I'm thinking, shit, I did that. Think about your family members when you've got this glamorization of the lifestyle that makes it look cool. Try and think about the harm that could be caused to your immediate family members, especially your mums. That's the most heartbreaking, isn't it? The effects on your mum. The effect on your mum and your community. You know, like, I never ever realised what I was doing to my community. Like, we'd be out in the flats and that certain people just piss. You know, like, need to go piss, they're pissing the block and that you're smoking weed, you're around. You create a shitty area for the people that aren't involved in that life. They just want a quiet life that have, you know? And then um, with family as well, like... I was a dark sheep in my family. Most of my family on my mum's side are cool in that. My sister, everyone's cool. It's just, it's become, you just become a burden to everyone, a leech. And, it, and you don't have to take money. It can be time. It can be worry. It can be stress. You know, like all this kind of stuff we do to like our family for like what? We're broke at the end of it and we need them. But when we're out there and we're free, we weren't even going to check, in, check up on them. We weren't even giving them a phone call or anything like that. But all of a sudden we're in prison and they get 20 phone calls, 20 letters, and we need to see them all the time. So yeah, um, just be aware that um, your loved ones will suffer as much as you, if not more, if you decide to go down this life. And um, yeah, it's just not the way to go. When shit goes down and you get arrested, it's your family who has your back. I always, yeah, always call my mum first. Yeah, yeah. Robbing a grow yard. Yeah, now we used to do this kind of a lot. <clears throat> we had uh, a couple of taxi people and what they would do is they would, we, we bought them um, thermal cameras. So we'd pay them a hundred pound to put that camera on top of their thing. And then they would give us like any houses that would come up red. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or white, whatever it was. And um, so we'd do that with Rob Grow Yards and that. And um, at the time I had a friend who was doing grows, yeah? But he was doing it for this other crime family. They, we didn't like him anyway, yeah? And they weren't paying my mate properly. And my mate didn't even talk to him no more because they took the piss out of him. They really put him in a bad position. So um, at the time, he's loyal to these guys though, yeah? And he's telling me about all the grows he's doing. Like, I'm in control of this. I'm in control of that. I do this. I know when this is coming. I'm like, yeah, man. I'm like, you should let me get them boys anyway, man. He's like, nah, nah, nah. Don't be silly. Don't be silly, yeah? But every time they tell me they're not paying him properly, this, that, the other, he's like, it always come with complaints. But every time he's going to, he loved weed just like me. So every time he's going to like harvest the crop, cut it down, he'd always have stories in that, yeah, for ages. And I'm like, I'm a robber, bro. You're telling the wrong person the story. You know what I'm saying? I didn't tell you that, but I'm thinking that in my head. So obviously, I can't do it personally. It's my pal, yeah? And it's not even his grow yard. He's just getting, I swear they was paying like two, three hundred pounds to look after, you know, just muggy peas, like, yeah? And uh, so I get two of the boys. I'm like, right, you're going to follow him. You're going to find out where it is. And we're going to go through this door, yeah? Because the people that he was involved with as well were like, they were arseholes. That's the best way I can put it. They were arseholes now, yeah? And uh, so um, he'd normally go by bus, but this time he went by train. So my mates followed him by train. We are in a car and we put up around the corner. So with him... He's always paranoid about me anyway, always looking behind him, yeah? Uh, but he never realised any of these guys that were behind him um, that were following him. So, uh, so um, we're waiting outside now. He gets off the bus and he goes to the spot. My mate's following me, loses him, but we find him again. We find the spot. And I don't know if anyone's ever been to a grow yard. It's so much the smell. It's just so distinctive. You know it from, from smoking a joint to being in a grow. It's two different smells, you know? It's like having a rose under your nose or it's like burning a rose and like being in a rose garden. Two different smells. We found it, but we had to wait for hours. A lot of people, with, when, when you're doing grow houses, they can't do the waiting thing. I never mind waiting. If I can get 20 grand for waiting 24 hours, I will do that. If I can get 20 grand for waiting 40 hours, I will do that. You know, whatever it takes, I will do. So, um... <clears throat> We're waiting, waiting, and this, the group's getting smaller and smaller. Even like, fuck, this ain't gonna happen. The amount of times, if you know about the grow yard hustle, someone will tell you, look, there's 20 keys ready to go in there. You go in there, they just started growing it, or they've taken all the things down. So more times, you're just gonna fuck up someone's grow. 
then actually get what you're meant to go. But this was perfect because this guy was telling me so everything was perfect, yeah? So we'd seen them actually come down with loads of carrier bags, yeah? But they had a van. It was a work van, part of their company, yeah? And um, that was kind of blocking like the bins. So we couldn't see if they was putting the bags in the van or the bins. Anyway, they put them in the van, yeah? <coughs> we thought there was cuttings though because when you grow skunk, it takes forever to cut it down. It can look like a bloody rainforest. You cut it all down, you let it dry out, you've got like three keys to your name. <laughs> but like, um, so yeah, they'd been cutting down and they'd been harvesting everything and they'd thrown it all into the van. Yeah. So I'm like, it's all in there ready for us to go. Wait for them to go. And then me and my mate, we go there, we jump over the fence and we got these stairs and there's like another, like a gate thing, but it's connected to two houses. So uh, because it was connected to two houses, the other people who, who actually lived there, I don't know if they knew, but it stunk, so they must have. Um, they were still in, so we couldn't actually do it. But just like a movie, we'd wait there maybe 20 minutes. One person come out, the other person come out. Oh, my God, we're so happy. We go up there, go through the door, jimmy it open. And like when you go into a grow yard and you know it's ready to go, it's just ready to go. But, um, oh, my God. We just, yeah, cleared it out and um, cut it all down. Now, if people who've done it or haven't done it, grow yards, they've got strings everywhere, holding up the buds. They're just everywhere. You know, everywhere. It's almost like... I can't describe it. Like a thousand pieces of string in this room everywhere from ceilings holding bits up and stuff like that, you know? So uh, my, was cutting it down. Cutting it down takes a little while. But yeah, I've done loads of grow houses. And most of the grow houses you go and do, like I said before, they won't be ready. And you're literally going to go there, kick off the door, run through there, and then you're going to mess up the grow yard. The person jumps out the window, whatever. And then, you you know, this happens all the time. They just jump out the window. I know some little Vietnamese guy or bloody something like that. Yeah, man. It's crazy, man. Did you make any blowback from that? No, make... no, 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 no. Because um, he's been working for these guys for years. Like, like, when I tell you, my mate was loyal. Like, so loyal. But you know when someone's getting taken advantage of? You know, like, and my mate was a good guy. And I'm just like, fuck them, bub. Do this thing with us. And like, he was just, yeah. But no, he was cool, man. My, uh, yeah. So what's your Charlie Slough story? I've got so many Charlie Sloth stories. Like, <clears throat> me and Charlie... Okay, the thing about Charlie Sloth here is he was always the type of person that would think outside the box. Before YouTube, before Facebook and all of this, he was creating... What was it called? Grimy Limeys was the brand, but what was the actual thing? It wasn't bum fights. It was a re reenactment of bum fights. It was... I can't remember what it was. But yeah, Charlie Sloth was always the type of guy that would have a crazy idea. He, was, he had one foot in the streets, one foot out. He would always be getting, buying weed off me, like a few keys here, a few keys there. Always come short. Charlie, if you see this, bro, uh, come on now, you're up now, innit? Come on, give me a little interview or something. Do something for your boy, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> always coming short. Always coming short. And your head of security, Harry, that's my boy too. I wouldn't use his real name, but you know, come on, bro. You see me, I'm out here doing something positive now. And his boys told me years ago I should jump off the roads. I'm jumped off of me. But yeah, so um, I used to sell Charlie's skunk all the time. And um, whenever Charlie needed something grimy to be done, whenever someone was taking the piss, he would call me and we'd get it done. And um, <laughs> yeah, that was it. I can't go into too much detail, but um, uh, yeah, man, me and Charlie Sloth, we, uh, we were partners for years. We'd be in my mum's house all the time. Um, and I'm just proud of him. I'm proud of Charlie for coming off the roads, creating something, maintaining it, sticking with his day ones and just blowing and being an inspiration. You know the ones there? So yeah, shout out to you, Charlie Sloth, bro. I'm sure he did a lot of hard work to get there. How did he get discovered? Okay, so with Charlie, he knew someone that knew someone sort of thing and he was always in the industry. Always in the industry. So he used to be an MC and he used to be a DJ for a private station called Raw FM. Massive station. It blew loads of people up. Made um, people like kind of famous. But Charlie was never one of the big names on there. Charlie was always the guy that would uh, DJ Sloth, um, was, it, was what he was called back in the day. And he was always like just a DJ, but never really a great DJ, just like one of the group, you know? But there was other people doing bit, bigger bits than him. And uh, like I say, Charlie was on the roads a bit, but he was always trying to find a way to do this media thing. And um, he went to just a couple of colleges. No, it wasn't even college. He went to, um, who was it? Who was it? Who was it? It's, anyway, some person, <laughs> was watching somebody else and Charlie was there and Charlie filled in on a lower, um, it wasn't a BBC at the time and he just got recognised from someone and then from there he just managed to just 
carry on. But he'd always been in the industry, always been around the rappers, and always thinking outside the box, you know? But yeah, man, Charlie's a good guy, man. And um, yeah, we're going to definitely do something in the future, but I haven't reached out to you yet because I don't want to be one of those guys that just like jumps in front of the cameras like, yo, Charlie, come on, you know, let me build my stuff up and I'll reach out to you, brother. So Daniel, how did all this begin then? Were you always in Camden? Always in Camden, my whole life. I'm a Camden boy from like day dot, you know? Um, <clears throat> how it all started, I'd say... I mean, you never really know how, you, how it all starts, you know, where you get your personality from, but I was bullied as a kid a lot. I was a good kid, you know? I think all, a, lot of, a lot of people are, we were just good people, you know? But I was bullied a lot. And I remember, I was a tall guy. I've always been tall. I've always been a big guy. But I've always also been friendly. I've also been easy to manipulate. You know, so if you tell me you're my friend, you're my friend. And I will die for you and you will die for me. That's what I feel and that's what I think. But usually it's not <laughs> how that bloody transpires. So I was always, always easy manipulated. Someone had a problem, I'll go and fight them for you. You know, I'm that guy. Yeah, was that guy. So I was always easily, people like smaller than me would be able to just control me almost, yeah? And um, I used to get bullied a lot and like- Was that at school? At school, around the flats, everywhere. Because I was just, I had that personality where I just want to just, uh, almost like a big, you know them big goofy dogs you get? And they just jump up, they bounce everywhere and the little dogs are like, what's this big oaf doing <laughs> going mad at it? I was like that kind of thing, yeah? And um, so yeah, I used to get bullied a lot. And then um, it was the frustration. You know the frustration, the constant attacks yeah, and the constant bullying. And it just, you just get fed up with that. You just, like, it just builds up and you start saying no more. But then what happens is I had that impulsive anger. I've had that for years. I don't know where it came from, but just an impulsive, irrational, Hulk smash anger, you know, just, 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 just that kind of thing. And um, with the bullying, I guess it didn't help. And it just created some sort of, big monster that would go around beating people up and hurting people and fighting all the time. And because of how I looked as well, I was tall and skinny, but I had a messed up mind. So I didn't look like your typical bully or your typical person you'd be afraid of, <laughs> you know, or anything like that. I was just that guy and I would just get, um, always having to fight because of how I felt inside. People, I guess, I, I, I don't know. So I was all, I think it started from the fighting and the, and the constant conflict. And then from there, people want you to sell drugs for them because they know you're a fighter and don't, people don't mess with you. So then you're like, yeah, well, sell drugs. What well, can make money now? And then before you know it, you just get so caught up into it. And then you're selling ounces, but someone down the road selling bigger bits or cheaper bits. And you're like, how to get it cheaper like that? Well, he picks up more. Give me some more. I want to do better beat him's prices. I think and that's how it happened. And I've always been trying to find a shortcut in life. I always want to get rich, but without actually putting in the legwork. I always want to get rich, but without using my brain. You know what I'm saying? So if I can go kick off someone's door and rob them for everything they got, that sounds good. If I can go down West End or go wherever and we can rob some offices and make some, that sounds good. Anything for the shortcut. I think that's where it came from a lot of the time. And how did your parents meet? I'm not sure how they met, but my mum was always from Camden originally and my dad was in and out of prison. And then, um, so I'm not too sure exactly how they met, but, uh, oh, no, actually, 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 I think it was my mum's brother. My mum's brother used to hang around with my dad and then they uh, met up. But um, my mum and my dad met up. But, uh, yeah, like I say, my dad was a drug addict at the time. He was going through his own stuff. And uh, when I was born, I think that's when he was in prison and he decided to get his life in order. Go to college, get off the crack and heroin and um, do something decent with his life, you know? Did, did you visit him in prison? I was too young for it. So I was literally a baby. I don't remember him ever being in prison. I don't ever remember my mum being on benefits. I just remember it was hard. We'd hide from that like, TV license, man. You know, TV license knocking the door. Mum would go like, shh. We'd hide behind the sofa and that. <laughs> but like, um, but like, yeah, no, I'd never really seen my, I'd seen my dad smashing my mum's house up a few times, but I'd never like, I'd see the arguments and stuff, you know, but I'd never really seen the, um, the negative side of my dad's choice of life. Yeah, too young. Were you interested in any school subjects? No, I, I really didn't like school. I mean, I think I didn't like school because everyone used to tell me I was smart when I was younger. I'm like, bro, I can't even do schoolwork. Like, what do you mean I'm smart? But I think it, what it was was how I used to, I don't know what it kind of was, but I just think how I 
see things and how I would be interested in certain things. But um, I could never just sit there and do the schoolwork, you know? And um, yeah, I didn't really enjoy school like that and uh, never really had an academic subject that I, uh, that I enjoyed in school, really. Apart from sports, everyone loves sports, you know? But apart from that, yeah, no. Any particular sports you liked? Football. I was never really good at it, but just, I, the running side of things. Rugby, I played now and again, but I, um, I'd always get sent off for being violent. <laughs> I'm rugby, you know, or it turns into a fight or I get suspended. But yeah, I, I used to like the, like the more physical side of things, yeah. How did you first encounter gangs? Okay, now, this is mad, but there wasn't a lot of gangs, yeah, when I was in Camden. Like, gangs weren't around. That was an American thing. What years were we talking about? Between 98 and up to the present. So gangs was never really my thing. Like, I, I never really got into a gang. I was like a one-man soldier, you know? Like, I would have beef with a lot of people and it would just be me. And I'd just catch people one at a time. <laughs> I was crazy. But like, um, so there was never really gangs. But now there are. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. But when I was younger, it was more criminal families. And um, you would deal with a criminal family. You'd make money with them and you'd just get in with them. And um, some are still going to this day. You know, they're still doing everything they're still doing, but the gangs now, they own the streets. The youngers own the streets, you know? The oldest try and manipulate them, but it's not working no more. So the criminal families see you as potential because of your violence? Yeah, yeah, they just look at you and they think, okay, then this guy, he's not going to get robbed. He knows everyone. So people are going to respect him. And you need anything, anything, whether it's entertainment or anything, it's, Designed for young people. Young people spend money. Young people do all this kind of stuff. And like, even like the young drug dealers, they sell 10 times more than the old drug dealers. They just do because they're just out there. They don't know what they're risking. They don't know the risk they're taking, all that kind of stuff. And they just go out there and they just do that crap. And you got arrested first time at age 12? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was, like I say, I was a people pleaser and I was a bit of an idiot. <laughs> so, um... The older boys would be like, oh, hey, Lazar, what's going on? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, what's happening? They'd be like, um, I think how it was was like, oh, we make some money, blah, blah, blah. This, that. When I'm 12 years old, I don't even know too much about money, but yeah, I want some money. Though. You know what I mean? I'll go shopping there, buy some bits and pieces, whatever. And they're like, all right, come with us. So I'll go with these older boys now, yeah? And I still see them. They're still around. You know, like, we've laughed about it since. But like, um, and they would take me like smashing car windows. Like, like I remember one time they're like, they, they took me to a car. I don't know how this happened. They're like pointed out the window. Like, yeah, smash this window, do this, do that. I smashed the one car window. And I'm in there for ages pulling out this car stereo. <laughs> and like, I remember 12 years old in that. Yeah, I run back there yeah, with a the thingy. And they're, like, and they're laughing. They're like, how did you get to the wrong car? We pointed, you know, like, I was just a crazy kid. And um, so they're like, all right, forget car stereos. Let's go down Euston. And I remember from Camden, Euston's down the road. This time, the England match was on. You know, like, we're just dumb kids, yeah? Well, I was definitely a dumb kid. Yeah, and these guys did not care about me one bit. So the England match was on. And um, <clears throat> we're in Houston. And I'm going to snatch a laptop for these older kids, yeah? So we go down to Houston. We're looking around for some of their laptop. They're like, yeah, this guy here. So I'm like, all right, cool. Now, I've never done anything like this in my life. You know, I'm straight from the estate, you know? Just a tall, dumb kid. And... um. So we go down there now, and I run past this geezer. I'm running past him. I must have done it, like, run halfway up the road. By the time I get to him, I'm almost out of breath. <laughs> yeah? I, I pull his thing. I'm, I'm weak, a little skinny arms. I pull his thing. Only the strap comes off. He's going like, oh, hey, 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 hey. And then because I'm pulling his thing, pulling his like laptop bag. So he's holding to the bag. I pull this strap, and I'm running down the street now with a strap in my hand. And I'm running into Houston Station. As I'm running, I just see about 50 police like that. They're going to the um, uh, match in Wembley. And this guy's screaming and now there's a kid running. Now the police are all looking at me and they start chasing me. And like, everyone knows the car park I'm talking about. It goes down. It's got a spiral in Houston, yeah? You can go down it to get down it and you go up it to get up it on the other end. I've run down there, yeah? It's like a whole row of policemen running behind me. down the spiral. But I'm thinking, as soon as I get down here, I'm gone. It's dark. I can hide under a car. But it was locked. It was locked. And I'm like, it was horror. You know, I'm just like... And then they just grabbed me and that took me to the thing. My dad was so confused because I didn't smoke weed. I didn't do anything. I just, and now I'm in Houston, been arrested for robbing laptops and I'm not telling my dad anything. Like, what was you doing? Who was you with? Nothing. Nobody. You know, like, 
Madness. Yeah. I don't think he ever really knew. Because obviously he died. We like, killed himself like 10 years later. Not even 10 years later. Like 7 years later, man. So he never really got to hear that story of why I'd done that. But yeah, man. That was my first ever um, encounter with the law. <laughs> so was it like they just give you a caution or oh, they just yeah, let your yeah, dad they, get you? When you're young, this is the thing that messes you up a bit. Unless it's really serious, they're going to keep letting you out. They're going to keep, 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 keep letting you out. If you get, keep, keep investing for burglaries, as long as you're not stabbing people, as long as you're not a violent threat, as long as you're doing crime for money, monetary gains, they're going to let you out. They're going to let you out. I, I, like, I'll go to court pissed off that I have to go court because I know it's going to be nothing. The first time I ever went court when I was 18, they sent me to prison. <laughs> yeah, so like it's definitely a different. When you're younger, you get so many chances. <clears throat> so many. What was the case that sent you to prison? Oh my God. Basically, I sent myself to prison the first time. People please up. Even pleasing the police. <laughs> I'll resolve your case. Uh, so anyway, um, I was a commercial burglar. And uh, we used to do offices. We used to just do a lot of commercial burglaries. All Apple Mac stuff. G3s and G4s they were back then. And uh, Canon Fireys as well. And we used to rob all stuff like that. And it was a, it was a good way of making money when you're young. Because all, all you needed was a new pair of trainers and some other bits and pieces. So what happened? I'd been arrested. My house was... I'd been arrested for like two burglaries. And then they'd gone and raided my house. And there was like loads of computer chips and all other stuff. Like just stuff that linked me to like maybe four to five burglaries. Yeah. And now there was a thing just come out. It was called TIC. TIC. Take into consideration. A few of my friends had done it. The difference between me and my friends is my friends was already in prison. Yeah. And they're just trying to clear up some cases. I was not in prison. I was out. So I said to the police, what about TICs? They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You can do TICs and basically you write it down and the judge don't get I'm thinking wicked. I, I TIC'd about 30 burglaries. Yeah. And that's why my, another why my criminal record is long. Because I just started TIC and everything. I remember <laughs> TIC and two burglary I didn't do, but my mate had done. I'm thinking I've hand it off. <laughs> so, so, so I'm thinking, you just tell police what you've done. They write it down. They say, go home. That's what, that's what I thought in my head, yeah? So they're writing it all down. They're writing it all down, yeah? All around London, like, just, 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 just terrorised, yeah? And um, get to court. And when I get to court, yeah, it's just like all the other courts, I'm there with my friend, yeah? And we're laughing in, like, the... Um, witness not the witness box you know in the, in, in the public gallery so we're in the public gallery and like we're just having a laugh like cracking joke and that and like the clerk of the court comes over is like the judge has asked us can you be quiet please never happened to me before judge fucking judge, judge is rude man not like the juvenile judges you know what I'm saying so anyway the judge don't even know who I am by this time and then they're like alright next case Mr. Lazar so I come out of the bloody gallery and I go into the thingy the judge is just looking at me <laughs> I'm like, okay. And then uh, they're talking, they're talking, and they're like, Mr. Lazar's been very active, but he has been helpful for the police. He admitted 30 burglaries, blah, 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 this, that, the other. And then um, the judge was just like, you know, like he had them glasses, looking down over the thing. And he's like, Mr. Lazar, blah, blah, blah. I don't listen to the judge because I just don't know what they say. They go use big words and all this other stuff. So I just go into another place. Bangs his hammer down, like, cool. I get to go to go. Some black, black security officers like, grab me. You're going to prison, mate. No, 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 you're on remand. I'm like, what's that? Because all I've ever heard is bow my whole life. They're like, yeah, you're going to prison. I'm like, felt them. I'm like, oh my God. So yeah, that was the first ever time I went to prison, bro. Uh, the first ever time I went to adult court. I basically put myself in there. If I just got arrested for the four burglaries and shut my mouth, cool. And I found out later that the only reason my friends TIC the gaff was because they cut themselves and they knew they had cut themselves so their DNA would come back. I was just TIC and gas for the fun of it. I'm like, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. They would never have caught me. I sent myself to prison. First day in Felton. Oh, okay. The first day in Felton there is very, very um, nerve wracking. Of course, you're going to prison, right? But it's the whole thing on like, you, you, you're in the cells and you see stuff on the walls. Uh, on the walls, like, oh, fuck this person, fuck that person, from this person. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. So you start reading the walls. And then you go into uh, um, the secure court van and stuff and then people are talking, we've been in prison before, you've been in this before. And I'm like, nope, nope, never been in jail before. And then they start telling you horror stories. Oh, watch out for this, watch out for that. Do this, do that. So now you're terrified. By the time you get there, you're terrified. You just like, you just want to get your dinner, go in your little cell and just like put the fucking covers over your head and just get out of this reality. But that's not going to happen. So they talk you through, they, they walk you through. I call everyone mate. What's happening, mate? What's going on, mate? Cool, mate. Yeah. 
So I get there and I've never been to prison before. I've never experienced it, you know, I've been to visit like people, but never been there myself. So I get into the prison and you go through the, uh, that checking in service sort of thing there where the governor's like, they strip search you and they uh, get your name, what you're in for and all that kind of stuff. I'm calling the officer. Yeah, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm in for this mate. And he looked at me and he said nothing. But I just did not like his look. Yeah, dirty look, yeah. And then he said something else to me. And I'm like, yeah, cool, mate. He's like, listen, I'm not your fucking mate, yeah? So get that out of your mouth now. Nah. I'm like, uh, sorry, mate. Uh, but, but it wasn't, it's just, I've never said the word gov in my life. I didn't know what to call him. Boss. What, 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 I don't know what they call officers. Do you know what I'm saying? And then like, but yeah, so, and then, so the prison officers was a bit harsh to me. And then um, you get your little microwave meal, whatever, and you're waiting to go to the cells. And they're calling people out, calling people out. You find out who your cellmate is, and then um, you just go back. But it's all a bit of a daze, really. If you've never been in prison before, you're just experiencing it as you go. The smells, the sounds, everything. You're looking for dangers. You're looking for re recognizing for faces. And yeah, so, 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 so it does take a lot. I think for me, when prison became real, really, really real, is when I woke up. I woke up and I'm like, I'm here now. It's no longer a story. It's no longer what other people experience. And this is now your experience. This is now your life. And that was when it hit me hard. And what I found about prison for me, it's almost like, I call it the curse of prison. When you're in prison, you're in pain. It is hard. You're suffering. Your people are suffering. As soon as you get out, that wears off within two weeks. And you're like, hmm, so what was I doing again? I mean, it wasn't that bad. And then and you start to make excuses. And before you know it, it's a vicious cycle. So trust me on this one. If you've ever been in prison, if you're, think, if you're in the game and you've got away with it, whatever, just, just hang it up before it's too late because everyone gets arrested. And I've got a friend right now who's in prison in Spain. Yeah. He, um, he got caught up in the Enco chat thing. He'd never been arrested in his life for anything. Dodge, you know? Like the guy was always got away. Like the guy, like we've done stuff and he's been the only one to ever get away. Like, and a lot of people have been in prison. Like this guy was very, very cautious. But in this life, you only have a certain amount of time before your time's up, you know? For everyone, you know? And, and if it's not that way, it's the other way. Since lockdown, I've had two friends murdered in, during lockdown, you know? And if you want to know what Spanish prison is like, watch UK Bodybuilder in Spanish Supermax. There's part one and part two with Chet Sandu on the true crime playlist. So going in Felton then, did you get your own cell? No, I didn't know anything about high risk prisoners or anything. So I'm doing whatever they tell me and whatever they say. So yeah, I was with a cellmate for the first, 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 on my first sentence, I always had a cellmate, yeah. What was it like just to talk to someone in prison? Oh, like okay, that? for some reason, I always had them fucking yardies that would tell me, uh, me a big gangster man, you know, me have, 200 people work for me. Me sell all the crack in the world. They haven't got no post order. They got no nothing in their thingy. No one's looking after them, but they're a big super gangster. And it took me ages to realize that a lot of people chat shit in jail. And I'm like, serious? What you do? I believe everyone. I was so gullible. So gullible. And I would always get the cellmate that would try and like teach me the ways and that. And he was just full of shit most of the time. And yeah, so I would always get terrible cellmates, man. Terrible. What are the ways that are full of shit? Um, like prisoners, yeah. A lot of prisoners, you'll notice the ones that talk the most and tell you about how gangster and how big and how stuffed they are. They've got nothing, no family, which is pretty sad, and no one supporting them. But yeah, I do this and I do that and I do this. And the amount of times I've seen people in jail, big guys, muscly guys, you see them when they're out and they're crackheads. They're literally crackheads. So um, it took me ages to actually realize um that most people in prison are actually not scumbags, but they're like, you know, they're just, they're full of shit, man. They're full of shit. <laughs> and uh, yeah. What kind of people did you choose to click up with? And did you know people from the streets? Oh, everyone. I knew everyone. I knew everyone. And people sometimes in my family, sometimes in my little cousin. That's how I met Richie um, Islington. Uh, I, I give him the name Islington. His name's Richie, but um, yeah. But I, like, you just meet people in jail. And um, I was always known, you know? My, this is my second name, Lazar. Like even from a couple of my uncles and that, it was always known. So yeah, now, prison, after like the first month I was fine because like I'd, I had, honestly, the first time I went to prison, I had about 30 to 40 mates in there. We'd all meet up at church and um, yeah, there was loads of us. There was loads of us. Did anyone try and test you? All whether? the time. Remember, I'm tall and I'm skinny, but I, I act 
like I'm, you know, just different. But it's all about the heart. It's what you've got in your heart. And I'd never really, okay, I let things go a lot. You know, like, so I try and get away from the confrontation. But if it's there, I'm just going to just swing the first punch because I don't even want to be in it. I want it to be over. So let's do it quicker than, ah, you know, like that kind of thing. But I always try to stay stand my ground. And in prison, you'll always get tested at first. And you may fight and get beaten up. You may fight and get beaten up twice. But people will soon know that they got to fight you. And no one wants to fight, not even the bullies, you know? So as long as you stand your ground and people, people. I've had fights with people in prison that are big, big. And I've really not wanted to get fight. But fights in prison don't last long, you know? Attacks in your cell, that's different. But a fight in prison when the bell's pressed and all that lasts like a minute, man. What's the craziest attacks that you saw? I've seen loads in prison. I've seen people getting their faces melted off with hot water and sugar. I see a lot of that in Felton. You know, a lot of that in Felton when I was first there. People getting hot water thrown in their face. Um, myself getting my teeth smashed out. Um, what other kind of crazy attacks? You know what I did see? And there was part of a lot of suicide in jail. Now, my dad had just killed himself maybe a couple years before. And um, so I'm in the block for some bullshit, fighting a screw or something, yeah? And like, there's a few of us there, some mixed race geezers there as well. Uh, I can't remember his name, um, but he's from West London anyway. And we'd go out on the yard and we'd be talking and stuff like that, bits and pieces, because you get half out of yourself um, a day in the block. And then one day you hear like, pop, pop, off, and this guy was just like how I'm talking to you, full of energy, you like, know, like, just like, was like that. I'm hearing like, bear running, the guy killed himself, yeah, literally next door to me. And um, you see a lot of stuff like that, suicides, people, and like with attacks, you'd, um, what's the worst attack I've seen? The worst thing I've seen in jail would mostly be, mostly just hot water and sugar. It doesn't sound like much, but when you put the jam in as well and it sticks to your face and it's just, it's not a good look. And when it happens to the black people and, it, and their wear skin's pink, it looks even worse in a way. Is that over drug debts? And no, nah, most of it's from the stuff outside. From the streets? From the streets, it just spills over. Yeah, so it's over. Gangs are like kill on sight with each other. Yeah, and remember, there's prison, there's, there's mobile phones. And not just any mobile phones, we're talking like smartphones, yeah? So all they're going to do is send you a picture. Like, you're not going to, in prison, it's the streets, but you're grounded. That's the best way to see it. That's the best way to see it. You can't move to another prison without any of that other stuff, people knowing. You can't go to a prison without people knowing. People put hits on you like that. Did you see any convict justice enacted on sex offenders or anyone with dodgy charges? All the time. All the time. So me, I was um, I was just a loose cannon, yeah? But if you was respectful to me, I was always respectful to you. Always, 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 always. But I was waiting for the disrespect to come, you know? And the SO would always be on the wing, um, which is a senior officer. So you have like your normal officers and then you have like a SO then a PO. Or period in the SO, I'm not even sure how it goes. But um, either way, like they would always like if my cell was gonna get spun, they'd be like, Lazar, you're gonna get cell spin tonight, so make sure you ain't got nothing in there. They was cool. And like if um a certain inmate, because you get a lot of mental health cases, so certain inmates that would just trouble on the wing, they would get us to bit punch up, and it was like a working relationship. But it also tell us about sex offenders. Now, I've known, and this is a story for anyone, I don't condone sex offenders in any way, but you cannot go off what the prison officers tell you or anybody because they have their own, own agenda. Their own agenda. And you don't know what it is. And they're just saying, yo, my man's this and my man's that. And he may not be. It may be a, a complicated case. So I kind of stayed away from that because you can never actually know 100%, you know? And um, people lie in jail and people chat shit and you know like so I stayed away from that but I, my, one of my codies because there was three of us that got arrested for a robbery the code that done nothing was just there at the wrong place at the wrong time but if he turned into the biggest nonce basher in the jail bro <laughs> and he like he really was not a criminal like but he was like what the hell like he would just get into that and it's mad how prison can take someone that's not even part of that and like just change them within a short space of time but yeah 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 that happened all the time People who were suspected of it would get um, done. But um, there had to be some sort of paperwork usually or, 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 or maybe an officer pointing at the obvious, you know? Yeah, because the guard might have a problem with someone and then just tell the rest of the prisoners he's a sex offender just to get him smashed. And they do this a lot. They, they, they do the kind of thing where you... Um, 
they play these games with you. You know, they play these games and sometimes the prison officers are just as frustrated as you. And, and, and like, yeah, you know, and now let me tell you another thing. Now they've stopped selling tobacco in prisons, people. Yeah. So now there is a massive, massive, massive influx of bent officers because now the bent officers to make four grand a week don't have to bring in drugs. They can just bring in 10 pouches of tobacco twice a week and they're making four grand a week. It doesn't smell like, like, like all that other stuff. So, um, and, and, and for a pouch of tobacco, like 30 grams of unbelief, you're talking 300 to 400 quid, two, 300 quid for one uh, half, like 30 grand pack. So um, sometimes I think like they just make prisons even more of a harder place to bloody, you know? What survival advice would you give to a young person going in for the first time? Yeah, like, okay, prison is an easier place, yeah? If you keep your head down, if you get tested and you don't respond, they don't have to respond to no test, they don't have to fight no one, they don't have to do none of that. The best thing to do is keep your head down, stay out of trouble and um, educate yourself and read a lot of books. And, and, and if they give you a TV, throw it out of fucking door, mate. <laughs> because that TV, the reason why they implemented TVs in my eyes is to stop you from reading books, to stop you from reflecting on why you're in, to stop you from thinking about the damage you've done and stare at a screen and watch EastEnders and Quarry. Yeah. TV's like a babysitter, isn't it? It is a babysitter. It is. And people are so dependent on it. And and like, you've got a library. And as people have got a TV, they're not even thinking about the library. But you've got like, come on, man. I, I, I refuse to have a TV in my cell now, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I refused to have one, yeah. and um, my cell got searched, and um, the guard insisted because every single prisoner had one <laughs> that I'd sold mine, <laughs> and I hadn't. I said, I just read, and yeah. they couldn't believe it. So they locked the whole yard down and yeah. went cell to cell looking for the TV I'd sold, which pissed everyone off. <laughs> and a lot, yeah. a lot of the other guards on the next shift knew I didn't have a TV, yeah. and they were like, yeah. yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So did you get visits then? Oh, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, now, all the time. Now, when my mum could, my mum would work a lot. And me, I was the jack of the lad. I had all the friends, all the friends. But, to, like, I literally had to bully people to come up to visit me. I had to bully people because when you're out of sight, you're out of mind in the criminal world. Doesn't matter. I've got my mate in jail for, in Spain now. He's done bad things for bad people. And um, he's struggling, you know? And it happens. It happens. What you do for people, you do for them at the kindness of your heart. But when you go jail, you're basically on your own. And you realise that. And you realise that, you know. But yeah, I did get visits from my friends. I did get a lot of drugs in prisons. Um, <laughs> maybe that's why people didn't want to come visit me. Because every time, if you come visit me without drugs, I'll walk off the visit. This is pointless. What the fuck is this? You know what I'm saying? And every time I'd visit someone, best believe I'm coming with loads of drugs. You know? Because that's just the way it was. And I uh, got nicked and everything. Man. Oh, long man. How it, did it feel with your parents come to visit you the first time? Okay, when my dad, my mum and dad was never together. So when my dad come, he was always trying to get me to see the lesson. And, you know, like, it would, like, say things and make me, like, be like yeah. Well, I remember one time I was like, ain't that bad there, dad. You know, like, the food's not that bad. You know, like, because I'm thinking prisons are going to be terrible. But then when you actually get there, it's like, you just got to sit down for a bit, you know, and you find people that you actually get along with in that and you can actually have something in common with. And you're like, okay, this isn't that bad. But then... We'll get into a few situations that will uh, change that. Seeing your mum come visit you, did that weigh on you? At first, no. At first, no. Like, it just didn't. Because you got to remember, when you're like this, you're almost a selfish person. When you're committing crime all the time, when you're all about you, yeah, you don't really see the harm you're doing to other people. You just need their support when you're down. You need them to pick you up. But what that means to them in their self, well, I didn't anyway as a selfish person. When I look back on it now, I used to think, fucking hell, man. You know, like my mum would work all weekend and she's got to like, take her weekend out to come and see her son who's in prison, who doesn't learn, who's always going in and out, in and out. And um, yeah, man, I was a terrible, terrible person, man, like in that thingy, like in, in, in that thingy, because I knew what you had to do and I was just trying to do it, whatever it took. And I would just, yeah, I was a bad person, man. How long was that sentence then? How, how much did you serve? Uh, the first one? Yeah. First one, I got 18 months. Second one, I got four years. The third one, I got four years. And what, what was the second one? What was the conviction? The first one was for commercial burglary. The second one was for drugs when they knocked on my door. The third one was for armed robbery. 
and the fourth and fifth ones for like violence. One was I got arrested for something I didn't do. Um, and what are some other bits? And just like bullshit, six months and like nine month sentences. What was the armed robbery and how did you get caught on that one? Oh my God. So like with me, I've always been around the boys that do the crime, but always, 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 but like the smash and grabs as well. I've always been around those guys. They've always, I've, like, I was a drug dealer, but I was also, I was just a jack of all trades, you know? But I liked, I liked the camaraderie, the camaraderie of like, oh, of us all getting in a car, we'd go get something to eat before we go and do it. If we're getting nicked, there's four of us getting nicked and we're going to go to jail, you know what I'm saying? And we never ever got nicked no, like, 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 on that. So, um, <clears throat> This when I was in debt these times, and I'm trying to find a way to get out of debt. And I'm like, what can I do? You know what sounds good? A cash van robbery. <sighs> sounds like I would just have all the answers to my problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. So obviously, um, they got done a lot around Camden. They were just massive. People was doing it, and it come to a stage where you'd run up to them and they'd just drop it, you know? And all you needed was um a portable uh, petrol angle grinder. You just go around to a spot and you can just open it up as long as the metal pin don't fall through. So um that's what we was doing for a bit. Remember, we're telling everyone now. We're getting cocky. We're like, yeah, we're going to go and do Morrison's. Morrison's in Chalk Farm. And uh, we're going to rob this. We're going to do this. We're going to get it this time, get it that time. Obviously, some people are uh, police informants. Now, me, everyone, you tell me you're my friend, you're my friend. We're going to do it. You know what I'm saying? And I always found the hard way. So I'm telling everyone what I'm going to do. Yeah. And they're like, okay. So obviously now Flying Squad have got an oppo on us. We didn't notice at the time. SO19 have got a um, obo on us. Two separate obos. Yeah. So we didn't notice at the time. And I'm at my... I'm with... One person I can't mention. But okay, so I'm with uh, me and my Cody now, yeah? And um, we meet at a certain spot. And this spot is my friend's house. He has nothing to do with anything. Nothing to do with anything. He was playing computer at the time. But he lived here. Morrison's is here, where they deliver the cash is here. Yeah, so we're literally scoping it out from his window without him even knowing. Yeah, <laughs> and then we see the cash man turn up, and I'm like, "All right, cool. We got a bike downstairs." Like, why you guys got a bike? He's just confused. You know, he doesn't know what's going on. We're like, back in a minute. Yeah, so we've gone round there, gone to go and do it. But I know, I know everything. I know the pattern. I know the energy. I know the feeling. And it was off. The fact that one, the, the people in the van were looking at us and, and they kept looking back. And I'm like, why would they be looking at us? We want to like, we look like we're going to rob them now. Do you know, like um, we're on a back of our R6, we're bannied up. It's a boiling hot day. I've got gloves on. We just looked out of the way, you know? But as I'm getting close to the van, my heart's going. Normally, as I get close to the van, I should be feeling normal. Ready to jump off and do what i got to do. But I'm like to my mate, Turn around and let's go. This ain't right. Yeah, it's just not right. He's like, you should, like remember when you got helmets on and a bike going, it's hard to hear. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, turn it around. Like, headbutt his thingy. Turn it around, sort of thing. So he's turned the bike around now. As he's turned the bike around, there was no one there. Like, the whole road was empty. People in cabs, people in buses. Uh, the whole, everyone was not a civilian. There was a policeman and they had big machine guns and everything. And so 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 now I've jumped off the back of the bike. They're all coming this way. There's a dead end here. So they all go, I've jumped off the back of the bike. I've got a massive helmet on. I'm running there. I've got a knife in my waistband. I'm running and I'm thinking I'm getting away. I'm thinking, all right, it's fucked, it's fucked, but I'm getting away. As I turn the corner, there's just two gas masks with guns. And I've never had a gun pointed in my face like that, machine gun. You know, you don't to shoot you or anything. I just dropped them. My legs just went anyway. And yeah, they arrested me for a, a robbery. And I'm... I would have got more if I attempted to do it, but the judge was like, this was a well, um, what do you say? Farcical plan. Um, um, and you was um, reported to the police eight different times before the... The judge was just making fun of us, basically, before he sentenced us. <laughs> Having a laugh. But yeah, it, it was um, one of those things, man. Your own circle is always going to eat you up in the end in this life. So what's your relationship with your mum like now? Oh, man. Just like me and mum, like two peas in the pod, you know? Um... She finally sees me doing the right thing. She finally sees me being positive. Like, I'm skint still. I don't, but I don't worship money no more. I worship money. My, money was going to make me happy. Money was going to solve my problems. But 
The one good thing about the criminal life is I made a shit ton of money. I made so much money and I got fat. I had like a 20, 30 gram watch on and I just felt like a fraud. I, I, like I, I didn't even like myself. I didn't even like my appearance. And um, I was arguing with so many people and I'm like, is this it? This was what I needed. This is what I wanted. This is what I've done all this stuff for. And it made me think a lot. And that was almost like the first transition of change where I just said, you know what? I need to do better because I've created a shit show. And my mum would always support me. And that's what is showing me that when you love someone and you really, really, really love them and you really, really want them to do better, you'll do what it takes, even at your own detriment. But then when you finally get it, when the other person finally gets it, it must be so rewarding, you know? Because I'd never go back to prison again. Like, above, I've been attacked in the street since, since, you know, since I've changed in there. I've had to bloody, like, find my inner peace and just take an ass kicking. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the, what's the alternative? To go and stab people up, to go, and, to go and engage in a false narrative that doesn't even exist, only in my own head. Nah, 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 I took that. But yeah, so um, my advice to anyone that gives up this criminal life, don't expect a round of applause. Expect to kick up the ass if anything, because there's people that couldn't say stuff to you before because of who you were. But now you're approachable and, and you're open. <laughs> expect some shit to come back. And um, I've contacted people. I've tried to apologize to certain people. And um, in my head, I'm like, yeah, man, people are going to be so engaged. They're going to be like, bro, it did not go the way I thought, you know? <laughs> People are like, they're letting me know. They're letting me know in all uncertain terms. They don't care how well I am in my life. It will never be cool. And I have to accept that because I made them feel like that. I put that on, the, I created that circumstance. So I can't be like, look, I'm in a better place, guys. So come and forgive me and massage my ego. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes you actually have to um, learn the lesson and still pay the price. When was the last time you were in prison? When did you get out? Last time I was in prison was 2013. That was for the um, robbery I didn't do. And um, I'd known, I'd known now that, okay, you're trying to change, but you, you, you haven't. You're still active. You're still around people. So this is the price. And I didn't have no tools to change. I didn't change to what? Do you know what I'm saying? Change to what? I only know this person, this version of me. But that version of you can uh, get broken down pretty quickly if you, uh, if you just be honest with yourself, you know? You mentioned the inspiration your mum gave you to change. What else caused you to change? Knowing I was better than what I'd created. Because I'm, you no know, depression is almost like we have this thought of ourselves in our head of who we are. And we'll think of a certain situation and we'll think how we react. But when that certain situation comes, nine out of ten times we don't react like that. And nine times out of ten, we're not the person we thought we are in our head. And um, I always thought it was other people. I just talk shit. Ah, he's an idiot. Oh, whatever. Oh, you're not real enough. But that's just an excuse. That's just the cover up for the fact that you're not trying to actually think about the situation you've done. And um, for me, what was the question again? Who inspired me? So you said about the inspiration of your mum's love yeah. that helped you turn your life oh. around. But I'm asking what else? So you're, you're talking that you looked inside yeah, looked and inside you wanted to be also, a different person. And I think, I think as you, if you're not a bad person, if you're not an arsehole, you're going to come to a point in your life where you're like, I've made terrible choices. You're going to go back over what people told you and it's going to be true. And you're either going to just distance yourself from that and you're going to be like, nah, fuck them and make them more excuses or you're going to engage with it. And know that you you just gotta just try something else and do and forgive yourself. See me, yeah. I wanted people to forgive me. I wanted people to forgive me, yeah. But I I, I necessarily couldn't forgive myself for certain things I've done, and I definitely, definitely, definitely couldn't forgive certain other people. <laughs> I'm like fuck that. They're never getting forgiven. This, that, the other, blah, blah, blah. But if you want that same sort of love given to you, you've got to sometimes give it out. And um, I let things go. There's people that owe me loads of money. There's people that owe me, you know, and no. Enough's enough, fresh start. And like, it's not easy. It's not like the whole world opens up for you and like the flowers start singing to you. And that now nah, above, you're going to be skint. You're going to have bills. And you're going you're gonna to have the same problems, but with no way of dealing with it. 
because the only thing you know is violence and this other stuff. And now you're trying to change, you've got nothing. So you're basically walking around with no ammo, no nothing, you know? And it's um took me ages, ages, years. I'm still on the path. I haven't, you know? What got you interested in YouTube? Guys like you that would tell your story and just, you know, just give out the honesty and help and... I always thought, yeah, I could talk about that. And sometimes I'd watch YouTubers and I'd be like, oh, I didn't say that right. I could have done this different and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know what? Yeah. And I'm always good at criticizing people as well. Like, oh, this and that. But it's easy to criticize someone when you're in your comfort zone. But just try and step out of your comfort zone, turn the camera on and talk. And whatever you're criticizing that person, just try it yourself and just see how uncomfortable it is and see how much you have to just, you know, it's a lot. But yeah, just people like yourselves that 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 have done been in this life and um and changed and done better and you know that you know and you've got your book and stuff and nothing's gonna happen if you stay in your head. Nothing's gonna happen if you just tell yourself you're a piece of shit. Other than you're gonna just start believing it. You have to actually change your actions and change things you do. That's why I'm on my own a lot, because all my friends, most of my friends are still criminals, they're still in life. And I don't get the benefit of the doubt. So you'll never see me with them. I'll never take money from a criminal to buy me some equipment for my house because it's linked to energy that I'm not trying to con connect with at all. You know? And that's just, yeah, that's it. So I've watched most of your videos and I've read some of the comments and it's like you've got this loyal following now of people who really support you and are rooting yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does it feel to have built that community? My God. <clears throat> like When you think about making a YouTube video, you also then become... The comment, the commenters as well, and you're like, oh well, and you almost give yourself a bad review. So I'm like, no, 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 these people ain't gonna want to hear my story. This is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. No one's gonna want to hear me. And when people validate you, they give you acceptance, and 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 they give you positive feedback, it just inspires you to go further, man. It, 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 and I used to watch YouTubers, and I used to think, how can they not focus on this other stuff? It's because the love overpowers the hate. And all them negative comments, all you've got to do is go to hide from the channel. And they can't even leave another, they've got to make another bloody, and I've seen people do it, make another bloody account. You delete my last comment, I'm making a new channel, you little piece of shit, bald bastard, all this. I'm like, man, I just feel sorry from that because you're angry at me for just trying to do better. <laughs> you're angry at me for just bloody, you know, what the hell, man? Yeah. But yeah, so no, I love, I love it. And I, um, sometimes I'm sitting there for hours reading comments and um, just replying to people. It's, it's just, it's another form of acceptance as well, you know? And it's nice to be accepted for who you really are, not what you're trying to be. And it's growing fast. It took me five years to get 2,000 subscribers. No way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a credit to your authenticity yeah, I think so, and yeah. your storytelling ability. I appreciate that. And I'm sure the people who, I mean, that two hours just went like that for me. I'm, I've heard a lot of these stories before, but Daniel's so engaging. Um, time just flies. So the link to his Living in London YouTube channel is going to be at the top of the description box below this video. If you want to check out more of his stories down there, he posts very regularly and um, subscribe to his channel. Um, that would be great. Huge thank you for coming on, man. No problem. Thank you for the... Um, is, is there anything you want to say to the people watching in conclusion? Like, at the end of the day, people, it's funny who reaches out to actually help you. Because you can have people that you're close to, people that you know, and um, they can look at you, know you from your past life and see that you've made a change and not reach out a hand and not try and help you. And no one owes you anything in this world. But then you get people like Sean that don't know me from nowhere and has actually reached out and they like, know like, give me an avenue to, to, to tell my story and an avenue to just get out there further. So when you try these things, just try anything new, just do it and don't think about what can go wrong, what can go right, just just to go for it, man. And then, yeah, you know, God knows what happens in the future. You may see my book there one day. <laughs> <laughs> so let us know in the comments what you thought about this. Huge thank you to all the new subscribers. Subscription logos in the corner of the screen. Huge thank you to Joe and James for coming out today to film this. And huge thank you to Daniel again, brother. No problem. Coming out and, um, love, man. Coming out and, and doing this with us. Appreciate it. Love, Excellent. Bro. Yeah, thank yeah. you.